Welcome to the Board of Education meeting for Queen Anne's County for June the 5th. I need a motion to go into closed session. Pursuant to the general provisions Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move for the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County to meet in closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction to consider matters that relate to the negotiations, to discuss the budget strategy and perform an administrative function, and to consult with counsel regarding an appeal and to receive legal advice. Do I have a second? Second. The motion is second to go into closed session for all the items listed. Mrs. Wright. Uh, for my please sign when I call your name. Uh, Ms. Morissette? Yes. Ms. Hart Hollow? Yes. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Yes. Okay, we're moving into closed session. We're back at 6 p.m. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting of June 5th. Would everyone please rise to say the pledge and remain standing in the moment of silence for our troops overseas and abroad and the local. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Of the United Hello, the first thing I want to do is, um, is mention that on May the 13th, Mr. Richard Smith was appointed by Governor Hogan to serve as a member of Queen Anne's County Board of Education. On May 30th, 2019, Ms. Catherine Hager, the Queen Anne's County Chief Deputy Clerk of Court, guided Mr. Smith through his oath of office and presented him with his proclamation. Mr. Smith, you are hereby seated as a member of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education to serve through November 2020. Thank you. So um, I'm, next thing is approval of the agenda, and I would like a motion to take number 8.01, signing of the agreements, and move that up to position 3.06, and to remove 8.01. So moved. Is there a second? Second. A motion is second to make an amendment to the agenda to move 8.01 signing of agreements to 3.06 of um, and uh, delete 8.01. Mrs. Wright. Yes. 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 Okay, I need a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. All in favor, Mrs. Wright. Again, board members, please respond once I call your name. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Marlowe? Yes. Mrs. Marlowe? Yes. Mrs. Lissette? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the firm. The motion carries. Okay, next thing, I need to a, a motion to approve the minutes from May 1st, 8th, 15th, both closed and open sessions. So moved. Have a second. second. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from May 1st, 8th, and 15th open and closed sessions. Mrs. Wright. Again, board members, please respond once I call your name. Uh, Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Marlowe? Yes. Ms. Lissette? Yes. Mr. Smith? Abstain. I have four in the affirmative and one abstain. Okay, now we can move into the fun things, recognition. All right, board members, please join me up front. Good evening, everyone. This is the fun part of the evening. I that it's on, but maybe not. Can you hear me back there? You good? Okay, awesome. So this is the best part of tonight. 
We have l several recognitions tonight. We're going to start with the Energizer Bunny, just like we normally do. The Energizer Bunny Award is given to a staff member or volunteer who just keeps on going. The award is sponsored by Bayview Financial through Chip Brittingham, Wayne Humphreys, and Mark Humphreys. And tonight's recipient of the Energizer Bunny goes to Miss Lori Milner. Miss Lori Milner, are you here? Excellent. <laughs> just a minute. So let me read a little bit about Miss Milner. Um, Miss Carol Camp, the principal at Graysonville Elementary School, nominated Miss Milner. She's the secretary, operator, and security, aka uh, Miss Milner. She's the epitome of the Energizer Bunny. From time to time, she arrives each morning. To, um, she arrives each morning to the time she leaves. At the end of the day, she just never stops. She welcomes every visitor into the building with a smile and a kind word. She screens visitors. She's even been known to ask the various police officers to check their ID. Excellent. That's exactly what we need. Um, she's truly a jack of all trades. Not only does she handle the front office duties, she willingly fills in for substitutes or teachers who have to leave early. She serves as a check and connect mentor to a Graysonville Elementary student. She delivers bus notes and personally makes sure that everyone in the school gets home safely each evening. And she works at the PFY program from 4 to 6, as if all of those other things weren't enough, Monday through Thursday. She works tirelessly trying to secure substitutes, many times working nights and weekends to make sure Graysonville has the coverage they need to start each day. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, Ms. Milner builds positive relationships with every student and parent at Graysonville Elementary, as well as with all of her colleagues. We're very blessed to have Ms. Milner at Graysonville Elementary School. Congratulations, Ms. <laughs> so do you have anyone here with you tonight, Ms. Milner? Well, of course, first my school, we learned a long time ago there's no I in team, but there is in family. And that's what I have at Graysonville Elementary. So have all I your have, Graysonville family come on Absolutely, out. please. My Graysonville family. And then, of course, my home family, my rock, my husband, 35 years, my son, Reese, my daughter, Celeste, my mother, and Tom, please come on up. Excellent. So our next recognition is for the Shining Star Award. Now this award recognizes a Queen Anne's County Public Schools employee who shines. This month, however, we're doing a little bit differently. We have three Shining Star Awards and they're going to come as a, a powerful package. So we have Holly Norell, Heather Tranquil, and Lana Williamson. Please come forward. Congratulations and congratulations. Yeah. Come right forward. So I'm going to read a few of the things that their um, nominator, Mr. Kentop, uh, at APA has to say about these ladies. All these ladies came on board as part-time grant-funded transition coordinators. Since joining us, we've been blessed by their nonstop determination to see students succeed. Each of these ladies spends time in classes with students, pulls them out for one-on-one -on -one work, spends immense amounts of time researching what the students need in order to be successful. 
And they also work diligently one-on-one -on -one to help students stay on pace with their home school um, courses. Some students at Anchor Points can be challenging on a day-to-day -day basis, but that does not stop these ladies. They know when to push, when to step back, and then when to try a different approach. Although they've been with us only a short time, they've made a world of difference. We're sad to know that the grant will end and that they won't be returning next year, but we're so grateful for everything that they do on a daily basis. Since our um, program runs both as the alternative high school program and as the alternative to suspension, we're grateful, extremely grateful, for the energy, support, and commitment that these ladies have brought to our students. So congratulations to each of you. And, and I'm going to pass the mic so that you can say who you have, who you have with you today. Miss Hildebrand. <laughs> <laughs> we we brought the entire team from APA. Please stand up. Come on up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Our next award goes to our difference makers. And this month, our difference makers are uh, folks that we have recognized as our Teacher of the Year partners. So we have several. First, I'm going to ask Mr. Chip Brittingham from Bayview Investment Council to please come forward, along with Wayne Humphreys. Please come forward. Bob Sullivan from Sullivan uh, Financial. Pamela Kissunda, I hope I'm saying that, Kasunda, and Miss Mickey um, Odit from Cosmos Air, and I'm not sure if everybody got to make it today. Tammy Taylor from Queenstown Bank. Tammy Harper from Kentmore Restaurant, so she's stepping out of her, her board responsibility. Marshall Hartman from Atelier Salon and Spa. And then Chris Marks from Preston Motor Company. Please join me in recognizing our awesome Teacher of the Year partners, Difference Makers. So my able assistant here, Ms. Wolf, Renee Wolf, boy, what would I do without her? She's going to help me make sure that everybody gets a token of our extreme appreciation. I don't know how many of people in the room today were at our Teacher of the Year Gala and Staff Gala. Was it fantastic? It was absolutely phenomenal, and it certainly would not be possible without the support of partners such as the ones that we have in front of us today. So we'd just like to recognize you and just to sincerely thank you for all that you've done to support us. So thank you very much. Okay, so our next award recognizes a pretty special group of people. 
Our next award goes to our retirees. So we are, and I see so many faces here, and so many faces that I don't know, so I know you're probably here to support these retirees. We are so, so grateful for the support that they have lent. The service to Queen Anne's County Public Schools has been phenomenal. So I'm going to call out names, and I'm going to call out the last location of the employee, and also the number of years that they have served uh, leading up to this retirement. So there may be some that have not confirmed that, that that may not have made it. Let me put it that way. But I'm going to call all of the names because at the end, I want everybody to be recognized. So I'll start with um, Deborah Palmer Whedon, a teacher at Queen Anne's County High School with 17 years of service. Next is Wanda Elliott. She is um, employed at Queen Anne's County High School, and she is the custodian there. I'm not sure if I saw her come in. All right. And then we have Peggy Weiser, teacher at Queen Anne's County High School. Are you here? And I'm sorry. The number of years, first of all, Miss Elliott had 13 years of service. Miss Weiser, 42 years of service. Teresa Gloyd is the math specialist at Churchill Elementary School with 26 years of service. <laughs> Jennifer Casey is the guidance counselor at Sutlersville Middle School with 33 years of service. Y your hands are going to get sore. Just get them ready. So we also have David Brown, who is the supervisor for accountability here at Central <laughs> Office with 38 years of service. So we're going to do them individually. Yeah, you, you give it to them and then they can stay up here. Miss Tony Schultz, coordinator of, we're going to ask you to stay up here, Mr. Brown. Sorry about that. Ms. Schultz, she is the coordinator of uh, supporting services, and she has 40 years of service. <laughs> Next is Ms. Marcelle Ryan. She is the finance clerk here at Central Office with 31 years of service. <laughs> And then we have Brad Engel, who is our supervisor for student support services here at Central Office with 30 years of service. He's not able to be with us tonight. <laughs> Mary Robin Scherer, she's a teacher at Bayside Elementary School with 25 years of service. Next, we have Ms. Nancy Adams. She is a teacher at Centerville Elementary School with 20, I'm sorry, Ms. Adams has 30 years of service. <laughs> Barbara Thompson, she's a school nurse at Centerville Elementary School with 25 years of service. Miss Billie Jean Fury, she is counselor at Centerville Elementary School with 19 years of service. <laughs> and then we have Cynthia, or Lynn Bush, I'm just going to say that wrong, Bouchamp, Beecham, okay, math specialist at Centerville Elementary School, 26 years of service. Linda Arlene Hyde, she is the administration, uh, administrator secretary at Centerville Elementary School with 40 years of service. <laughs> Congratulations. Ms. Farnell, what are you going to do? <laughs> I, I know, I know. You, you'll be hired, you, you'll be busy. Next, we have Mary Alice Munson from Sudlersville Elementary School 
with 32 years of service. Sarah Clark is the school assistant at Sutlersville Elementary School with 30 years of service. Nancy Jones is the teacher at Kennard Elementary School with 24 years of service. And then we have Mr. Dunn, who is the principal at Centerville Middle School with 40 two years of service. He was not able to attend tonight. And finally, we have Donna Gold, who is the school assistant at Ken Island High School with 21 years of service. And I know that we have several principals uh, with us today. I know that I saw, uh, of course, you know Ms. Farnell is here, so I'm going to ask you to come forward. I know that Ms. Louisa Welch is here. Mr. John Schreckengoss is here. Uh, who else? What other principal am I missing here? Oh, there he is hiding behind. Mr. Walls, please come forward. Ms. Carey, please come forward. Any other principals did I miss? Ms. Camp, did we... I don't think she has a retiree. Did I get everybody? Please join me one last time in congratulating our retirees. that we're going to do a little bit of a break right now. So we're going to enjoy some refreshments and just please take a minute to congratulate our retirees and all of our award winners today uh, just for, I'm sorry, did I miss something? No, I did miss something. Okay, but you know what? I did miss something. So Ms. Shelch, you first. We're going to have a little group photo with Mary Alice and Nancy and me, because we all graduated high school together. Okay, so don't go anywhere, don't go anywhere. Did you, did you get your photo? Did you get the photo for everybody? Okay, so all right, so you can go sit down, but don't leave, don't leave. All right, so last but certainly not least, I'd like to recognize our nationally certified school nurses. So the National Board for Certifica Certification of School Nurses advances the quality of school health services and school nurse practice. The rigorous credentialing sets the professional standard for school nursing, and the nationally certified school nurse credentials reflect competence and professionalism. In order to earn national uh, certified school nurse, a registered nurse must demonstrate a high level of education, clinical practice, experience, and knowledge. And tonight we will recognize three nurses. First, uh, Julie George, Tracy Higgs, and J.C. Riley. Come on down. We are also recognizing a certified pediatric nurse tonight, and this validates knowledge and expertise of pediatric nurses beyond the RN licensure. So tonight we recognize Desiree Peck. Well done. Congratulations. Congratulations. And congratulations. Thank you. So do you have anybody here with you tonight that you'd like to call up for our picture? 
You got your people. Anybody else? Oh, Barb and Margaret. Yep. Margaret. Come on, Barb and Margaret. Margaret come on. Barb. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Miss Kaufman, come on. And anybody else? Anybody else? My son, Andrew. Andrew Peck. Mr. Andrew Peck, come forward. And so at this time, we will take a 15-minute break. I believe we have embedded into our schedule. Please mingle for a few minutes, grab some refreshments, and congratulate all of our awards winners and our retirees tonight. We'll be back in 15 minutes. The one I did. This, it's not on here. And I'm going to no, not on the paper, on the computer. Having entirely too much fun over there. Well, thank you all for staying. It was a really good audience we had before. <laughs> okay, next item we have on our agenda. I'd like to reconvene the meeting. Um, we we have been working really hard, very hard, with all of our negotiating units um, to come up with some agreements well before, well, not well before, but before July 1st, and that was uh, is our ultimate goal each year before the new school year starts, to ha come to some agreements with our bargaining units, with our, our staffs on uh, the compensation <coughs> packages. We start way back, and they do too, back o October time frame, November, no October, to try to start to work these things. It's a difficult process, very difficult. Um, not not working with each other as much as not really knowing what our budget's going to be until the commissioners strike the budget, as you all know, like May 28th is when it was struck. So we try really hard to come to agreements and where we would like to go and hopes, and when we f all fight together like crazy to get the actual budget that we want to incorporate what we've, agreement we've come to. We're very fortunate this year, and we've come to agreements, and we're going to be signing them tonight, and we're very happy about it. Before we do that, though, I want to um, have a motion to approve the uh, negotiated agreements for certificated units one and two and support units one, two, and three. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion and a second. 
to accept negotiated agreements with certificated units one and two and support units one, two, and three. All in favor, Ms. Wright. Well, members, please respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harbor? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Morset? Yes. Mr. Smith? I'm going to abstain, and just because I'm just coming on board, a lot of this stuff I haven't gone over yet. Thank you. I have four of the affirmative and one abstain. The motion carries. Okay, negotiated units are approved. Uh, negotiations are approved. Uh, first unit we'll have is uh, certificated unit two, and then we're followed by certificated unit one, and then the support units one, two, three. <coughs> this is for the signing of the contracts. If I may, Captain Kelly, Dr. Kane, members of the board, on behalf of ANS, thank you. Uh, as stated, we've once again um, negotiated an agreement uh, of which we're very proud. Of. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. anywhere Yeah. 
one big picture with everybody. Good, Mark. Two more. It's a lot of signing. Three. Yeah, it's a two and there's two and then this is three. Support two. Support two. She messed you up. Karen messed you up, didn't she, Art? Well, I'm going to go below this. <laughs> Fine. I guess you did the same thing here. Oh, no. Wow. This is three. 
great guess. I think it'd be solid. Captain Kelly and I came to do those. I don't think everybody, we need, we need more of your association. Mary's going to sign. Okay. Sign up here. Yep. Okay. Well, Mark, congratulations. Is that the right one? Is that this one is. Sure. This one's the right. Three all down. Okay, so that one's done. Now we'll mark on this one. Mark on this one. Oh, what's that one? Oh, that's Oh, that's that one. 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 Oh, Look at that one, make sure that's sure. because the top is not okay. still there. Here so. Here's two. Uh, I think that should be um, uh, not so Karen signed out here. Oh, okay. So yeah. we have Thank all you. the signatures that we yes. get there? Yes. Yeah, we do. Okay. Right. And this one is two. That's my two. This one is three. 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 And this is a three. Two. Three. And a three. Thank one, you. two, three. One, two. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, the next item on the agenda is our uh, board involvement. Um, it's been a really busy time, and I really, this is my favorite time of year on the board when we actually do the graduations, and the students were always inspiring um, sometimes we have a lot of work and it's difficult making decisions all year but that is the the two graduations is one of my all-time favorite events that I do in fact that's what keeps me going the whole next year is watching the students graduate all kinds of students um, and every single one of them had smiles on their faces and that was very rewarding and that's pretty much why we do this job so I'm just going to mention that. I went to some great uh, uh, reward, award ceremonies. Um, phenomenal the number of students that receive awards, uh, <coughs> seniors at both schools. It's very Im impressive. Um, so that this is the best time of year. So if you ever get to go to any of those graduations, it's really worth it, totally worth it. Makes me hang in there. Any other board members, please? Well, I want to thank um, my fellow board members for allowing me my idiosyncrasies at the Callan High School graduation. Um, I had 15 seniors this year, and 80% of them had started working with us at Kentmore when they were freshmen. So uh, it was very, um, very emotional for me watching these young men and women grow and become the, the uh, people that they are. And I thank you for allowing me that. And so they sent me pictures and, you know, moms sent me pictures just, it was very great to be able to hand them the diploma. So thank you all very much for letting me do that. Do you guys have anything you like? Um, I attended in May, at the beginning of May, uh, the PFY track championships at Kenallan High School. So that was amazing to see all the middle schools come out. Mm -hmm. um, and a shout out to my son's relay team. They set the school record for right. time. Excellent. <laughs> Um, I also attended the Queens County High School Awards Night. Lots of money awarded that night. Those kids did an awesome job. Lots of hard work went into that. Um, and then we all attended Mr. Smith's swearing in. Yes. All graduations. Nothing. Absolutely. It has been a busy month. So we started the month with our character counts. We attended the character counts appreciation dinner. 
um, and that was on the second. We had the Carson Scholars Awards Banquet on May the 5th at uh, Martins West, and that was absolutely wonderful. We have some uh, wonderful students who were recognized that evening, and our very own Scarlett Pedroza was uh, featured as one of the um, singers that evening. So she attends school down at uh, Kent Island High School, and she's also one of my superintendent student advisory members. So good, good job to all. On the 6th, of course, we, uh, we meet with our commissioners or cadre of our commissioners each month, and so we had an opportunity to do that again. I think it uh, has served us well in um, ensuring that we all understand um, how, actually it wasn't on the 6th, it was later in the month, but how the budget goes and how it impacts our entire school district. So glad to have that. Uh, went to Chesapeake College to um, meet with um, Commissioner Wilson and several others, some of the superintendents on the Eastern Shore to talk about um, any possibilities for any type of a um, sort of a, a CTE extension um, for a partnership, maybe a, even a regional program. So we did have that conversation and that continues. Uh, I serve on the MSDE uh, Discipline Task Force, so we met a couple of times this year. Of course, um, I was attending a conference in the middle of the month and I was unable to attend our work session because I was at the Women in Leadership, National Women in Leadership Conference, and that was an absolutely outstanding conference, actually one of the best that I've been to in a long time. Just a very small, uh, intimate group of women who were CEOs and superintendents of schools and uh, just really having some um, quality time to really resolve some issues that, that are, are faced by women in leadership today. And um, Ken Island High School's Innovation Night was on the 16th. Um, I had an opportunity to um, support Kennard um, Alumni Association, Kennard African American Cultural Heritage Center on Sunday or Saturday, May 18th for their building dedication. Thank you. They allowed me to uh, be MC for that program. A big shout out to uh, Clay Washington and certainly our very own Miss Janet Pauls who um, took a, a leadership role in that and it was just an outstanding event that day. We had our um, Teacher of the Year recognition at MSDE, so all of the Teachers of the Year across the state were there, and we heard from our State Teacher of the Year, and that was a great day. We had a, um, the Spring Athletic Awards at Kent Island High School on the 21st. Right around the 22nd, we um, had our commencement at Chesapeake College for our students who were graduating um, from Chesapeake College. So that was a great night. So our college, our graduation started uh, a week before. And then of course, we had Mr. Smith's oath of office and that was a wonderful, wonderful time along with both of our high school graduations. I'd just like to mention two other things. Um, they have not yet occurred or one has occurred and that is our Destination Imagination team from Mattapique Middle School. They scored 41st out of 83 teams, which is great considering that they were the youngest in the category. So shout out to them, well done to those, um, those students. And also on Friday coming up, we will be having a wetland day at Graysonville Elementary School, recognizing some of the environmental literacy work that's being done there. We'll have the unveiling of a uh, wetland sign for our, our habitat, our environmental education habitat down there at Graysonville Elementary School. And big shout out to Ms. Camp and to Mr. Page for helping to organize that event. Several of our partners will be there and students will be outside enjoying the outdoors and learning outdoors as they should. So it's been a great time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Paluski. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, very quickly, uh, May the 2nd, I had the opportunity to attend uh, with my other colleagues, Deputy Superintendents, Assistant Superintendents, the uh, Maryland Common uh, Ground Conference, which was in Ocean City on the 2nd and 3rd. Uh, Mr. Tolley and I on uh, May the 9th uh, visited Easton High School in their uh, junior ROTC program and, and we're thinking about some possibilities of offering that here to our students. On uh, May 10th, I had another opportunity with Mr. Tully and uh, Mr. Blackinson and Mr. Fredrickson, uh, both our CTE teachers uh, at Queens County High School, I had an opportunity to go on a field trip with the students to a local construction site. Uh, where they got the opportunity to network with local contractors and, and potentially for summer job opportunities. That was wonderful. I attended uh, on May 15th, the Sunday Supper, I believe the seventh or the eighth Sunday Supper that we've had. That was outstanding. Uh, with, uh, alongside uh, Dr. Kane, the Chesapeake College graduation, 
Also alongside Dr. Kane and Mr. Tully, we attended the fire school graduation, which was a, a, just a tremendous opportunity, and of course our, our recent high school graduation. So tis the season, uh, it's winding down. Uh, but as we say in curriculum instruction, I think there's only about 65 days until we open schools uh, <laughs> shortly. So we're planning ahead. Thank you. Uh, trust me, my son doesn't want to hear that. <laughs> Nor do our principals. <laughs> Okay, um, the student board members, we have, have the outgoing two student board members, um, Ariel Miles and, and Marissa Teddy. See, they're not sitting here, but they, are, um, they graduated last, last week, and um, they did, as we told them, we actually recognized them at the graduations, and um, that, they were really surprised, and I think they were pleased. Um, Miss Teddy, um, ever the, the uh, diligent person she is, she sent a student member board report for this month. Um, it was a successful yearbook uh, distribution May 20th. Um, she wanted to thank the yearbook class and advisor Mrs. Mamas. The class of 2019 graduation, the turf fields are under construction this summer for both high schools. The last day of school is June the 17th and she noted here that her replacement for next year representing Ken Island High School is Skylar Pedraza. And that brings me up to Queen Anne's County. The replacement for Ariel Miles happens to be in our audience. Her name is Shannon Billup. Shannon, could you stand just for a minute? <laughs> well, Shannon, we're really looking forward to having you on our team here. And um, it, it's a, a big job, but not too big. And um, we appreciate definitely appreciate your input. The more input you can give on behalf of the students, the better. Uh, we do near, need to hear how your students and how you re and represent your students' opinion on many of our decisions. So welcome. We're happy to have you. And thank you for coming tonight. Now our citizen participation. We ask all speakers to keep in, keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Any comments longer than that should be submitted in writing. Organizations have five minutes, individuals three minutes. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item, agenda item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. They should be discussed at the bargaining table. This is not the proper venue to address specific students or employee personnel matters, especially those matters on legal appeal to the board. Comments about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through the available channels. Citizen participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your questions at a later date. The board respects your desire and convey your right, uh, your right to convey your message freely, but ask as a courtesy of this board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from name citizens and name calling when you offer critique. The only name on this list is Mr. Richard McNeil. I might have raised all the rest of them. <laughs> Good evening. Um, here on behalf of the retired school personnel, we'll make a few comments and I'd like to again welcome uh, Dick Smith to the board. Uh, uh, jump right back into it, Dick, and hang in there. Um, the retired uh, uh, group uh, awarded two scholarships this year. We had eight applications that were all exceptionally um, well put together, so it made that committee tough. Uh, the first one from uh, Queen Anne's is Elizabeth Sterling. Uh, she will be attending uh, Towson University with uh, the goal of becoming a uh, teacher. At, uh, these are all goal-oriented towards uh, coming back into supporting our school system. From Ken Island High School, it's uh, be uh, Brianna uh, Buck Buckrick, if I said Bundick. that correctly. Brianna Bundick. Okay, thank you. Uh, and she is attending Salisbury University. Uh, we will be um, recognizing them at our luncheon on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. And um, uh, they have been invited and their parents have been invited and so forth but they got their awards at their awards uh, assemblies at the school. Uh, we were real pleased to be able to uh, support that. In fact, we just had a committee meeting yesterday where we're hoping to be able to extend that to more students and or more funds. Uh, but 
we're looking for that. Um, the number of people who were uh, retiring, uh, I got the list yesterday and I think there was 20 on there. Um, we're hoping to uh, have a breakfast, uh, we're planning on having a breakfast for all those folks and anybody else on the first day of school. Now you people will be busy. <laughs> we'll be very busy. <laughs> but uh, research has shown that um, in, uh, especially folks who work in a school, there's a bell to end, a begin and a bell to end. And uh, when you do that for 40 years, uh, your body gets acclimated to August, September, starting with a bell and then going through June, you know. Uh, and we, one of the things that we have read about and, and I think is very important, that once you retire from this type of situation, no matter what your role is, that you do something on the first day of school that's not school related. So I keep that in mind to uh, Dr. Kane when you eventually um, <coughs> step away from this role, you. you know, you come into something else. You know, at midnight when you get home. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we're, we're pleased to be able to do that. We're getting ready to go out and individually uh, welcome them to our group and invite them to join um, and invite them to our October um, uh, meeting with a free, free lunch for them and so forth. So we're encouraging that. Uh, our organization works very closely with the state to monitor the pension system more than anything else. And, um, and, and as you all are working through a budget, the state works through their budget. And there, that, that pension money is always a big pile of money that is looked at by a lot of legislators like, well, let's borrow some, which has happened over the years. And one of the things that we try to do <coughs> is to keep that conversation going back and forth between those who are retirees and those who are going to be to, to make sure we are on top of that. Um, on a side note, uh, I want to let you know that um, I work with uh, first and second year teachers as part of the mentor program and I, I have to say that uh, the last half of the year, the six mentors that I've worked with have really grown professionally. Uh, I think that, you know, they're going to help our system tremendously. Um, it's not that they're perfect yet by a long shot, but they have all been, the ones that I've worked with have all been very coachable. Uh, they listen to suggestions, they listen to the critiques that we do it on a one-to-one -one basis. And uh, I, th I thank Dr. Kane and uh, Janet Pauls for uh, having that program. Uh, I know a lot of counties don't do it that way. And uh, I think what we, the way we do it by using retired folks to go in and, and have the time to sit down and really work with these folks. Um, it's been a long year for some of them. Uh, is like any first time on the job, you know, you have your ups and downs, but overall the six that I worked with have uh, survived. And uh, as I met with them all this week, uh, for my last time, I told them, you know, don't celebrate until the 18th and, and have a great summer and so forth. So thank you, Dr. Kane, again thank for you. that. So thank you very much. Mr. McNeil, thank you. Also, I just wanted to thank you. Um, it doesn't sound like you're retired by what you're, you do, um, and you're still having an impa impact on the on the school system. We really appreciate it. All volunteer. It's all volunteer work. Thank you. Uh, I was, I was look, listening to that. This is my 50th year, <laughs> and uh, you know, I said that to um, uh, one of the secretaries at um, down in Stevensville. And she said, "How can you keep doing this?" I said, "Well, you know, it's it's." fun to be able to help somebody get off to a good start and if I can contribute to that and, and still help somebody and, and, and I'm not the only one doing it but uh, uh, that helps me makes me feel good too. Um, we have had tears shed by some of these folks um, they, and we've cheered each other on and, and so forth and to me the, one of the big things about the program is that it's one on one. You know, it's, 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 it's not like I'm giving a report. I don't come to the superintendent and say so-and-so is not doing what they're doing. We, we, we work through that, and uh, I, I do appreciate the program very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Okay. So the next item is the presentations. Bear with me.
Okay, so as we get set up, our first presentation this evening is going to be um, information about our summer programs and Anchor Points Academy. That will be followed by um, a report on our federal grants, including our Perkins grant. And then that will be followed by our uh, education facilities master plan and uh, the summary of changes that go along with that. Good evening, everyone. Um, Captain Kelly, uh, exec team, board members, welcome, Mr. Smith, <coughs> to, our, to the board. Um, for the record, my name is Susan Walbert, and I'm the supervisor of early learning Title I, Title III in migrant education. Uh, and I'm Kevin Kintop. I'm the program director for Anchor Points Academy uh, in charge of online learning and the high school summer school program. So tonight, um, we are going to give you an overview of the summer programs offered in our, in our system. By the end of this presentation, we hope that you have a better understanding of the Title I extended year programs and the high school summer programs. So what you have is uh, the first uh, graph that here that you have is our Title I program, extended school programs at Graysonville Elementary, Churchill Elementary, and Southersville Elementary. These three schools have similar programs is that in that they um, are running from June 24th to July 25th. They're working with grades uh, one through five. Uh, Churchill and Southersville Elementary are also including kindergarten. You can see from the chart um, the staffing that's involved, the curriculum that they're using, and then the funding sources. One thing that's different about Churchill and Southersville Elementary this year is um, Southersville Elementary is getting some needed attention with paint and things. So we are exiting Southersville Elementary and they will join forces with Churchill Elementary. So those students will be bused to Churchill for, um, for them to collaborate um, and that, that program will run together. We also have a summer school, um, extended school year at Southersville Middle, which works with mainly their fifth graders. And you can see from the chart um, how they choose their students, the staffing, the curriculum that's used, and the funding source. All, all four of our um, Title I schools have extended uh, summer programs and they all participate in the Maryland Summer Food Program so that our students get breakfast and lunch before they uh, head home. One additional program we have is our Migrant Education Program, which is grant funded. This year we will be housed at the Centerville Elementary School. Thank you, Ms. Farnell, for allowing us to use her building. The dates run a little bit different. Um, we begin July 8th, and that is to accommodate some of our migrant families that um, join us later in the, in the school year, or later in the month, excuse me, in the summer, coming um, into Friels. And um, so we, we kind of push back our program a little bit to accommodate them so that they can enjoy um, the program. We'll finish there um, on August 9th. We um, also participate in the summer food program. The difference with our program is that it's full day, and we also we serve birth to 18. Ms. Wahlberg, may I ask a question? Why is it not in Southersville Elementary School where it's traditionally been? It's getting painted. Oh. So Southersville Elementary is getting some, some needed uh, attention. And really, we've been doing programs there for a while, so they always have to jam whatever they need to do. Mr. Pinder is very happy with the fact that, that we are making this happen. And so is Mr. Walls, um, but they, we've always been there. Right. So they never get the real attention that some of the other schools get. So we accommodated that by moving to some other places so they could have that done. Do you think it would be a hardship for some of those families to travel that far? We bus everybody. And, and actually our migrant population has, um, it, is, it is, there is just as many students centrally located as there are North County now. So we're kind of we're we're kind of meeting everybody halfway, and, and we do transport. So thank you. Uh huh. Any other questions? Or does this this helps our businesses when they hire people? Is this is this a plus for them to know that we have a train or school system that will help them? So do you mean for the migrant population? Yes, I mean if, are, are these 
residents or people that are coming in just for summer work? So, so let me tell you, so most of the ones that are at Friels live there. Um, and if you ever get the opportunity, and, and I'll make sure that, that everyone gets an invitation to when we do, um, we do some site work there at the, at the actual camp where they live, and we'll go out and provide them with some books and, and do some activities with them. If you've never been out there to see, um, it, it's really, an, it, it's interesting, and it, it's, it's um, just something that, that a lot of people who have lived here all their lives don't really even realize um, what's happening out there. But there is, a, um, there is about 12 or 14 trailers, and the families mostly come from Texas. It's usually the same area in Texas, and they travel when the crops are ready. So it's seasonal. It is seasonal for them. Now, we have families that migrate here. <coughs> It has to be for agriculture or fishery work. So we do have families that migrate here, but after three years, then they're no longer considered migrant, if that makes sense. So they migrate here, but then they stay. So if they're migrating for agriculture work and then they stay, then they lose that status. But then do they become students of our regular if they're, school? If they're here, they're our students. In the summer, mainly the ones that, that are in and out just for the program are the ones that are there at Friels. It's a very successful program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and everyone will be invited to our end of the year showcase so that yeah. you can see our families and see what we've done with the students. I've been to several of them over the years, and it's it's yeah. it's wonderful. Thank you. In top. Okay, so for the high school summer school program, um, it is probably our most important dropout intervention uh, program that we have because it allows students to catch up on credits that they along the way have not been able to maintain, whether it's after freshman year, sophomore year, junior year. Um, this program is a, is a welcoming environment where kids can come work on whatever courses that we offer and we put a certified teacher in that room with them. They kind of work on their own pace. It's an online learning option, but we have a certified teacher in there that can work with them through different programs. So um, this year, we are in our second year at Chesapeake College at the Eastern Shore Higher Education Center. Uh, we started a partnership with them last year, so this will be the second year that we brought the program there. Uh, this year's dates will be July 2nd through the 30th. We work Monday through Thursdays, and we have two sessions, each of them lasting two hours and 45 minutes. We have buses that leave from Kent Island and from Sudlersville. They each make a stop on the way before coming to Chesapeake College, so it is an option for students to have transportation, but they have to either get to from the south end at Kent Island High School or Graysonville Elementary, and from the north end, Sudlersville Middle or Queen Anne's County High School. We also run a bus in between the sessions, so if they're only coming for one session, there is opportunity to ride back and forth. The cost this year, we believe, is still going to remain what it has been at $200 per credit, $135 if someone is on reduced lunch, and $90 if they're on free lunch. Um, we have offered some scholarship opportunities. The high school summer program historically, and this can be confirmed through finance, um, is not something that is a money maker or a money break even type situation. We, it is a cost we do. We collect the money to help reduce that cost to the system, to pay for the teachers that are there. And last year, we increased our transportation costs so that we could get more students to the program. So just to let you know, that is something we're looking into, potentially raising a little bit. But it's one of those things, if you raise it too much, then you lose that intervention that you have with kids because some don't take and participate in it. The courses we currently have listed to offer this year, um, there are four Englishes, three in the history sec section, three in the math. Um, I apologize, I don't know why the slide is weird here versus mine, but there's three sciences, for marine life, um, which is going out. We are almost at the point where marine life sciences wasn't an option for students anymore, so we have a couple of kids later on that can do that credit recovery. But we have chemistry that we're adding this year, and two new, uh, or three new courses this summer are physical education, health, and fundamentals of art. And these, we think, are gonna attract more kids to help be able to get some of those credits caught up before they head into their next year at school. Any questions about the summer school program? Is that, is that any, anyone can attend or is it only course recovery? It's only credit recovery. Okay, so they can't like get ahead on? Not uh, currently. That is something I may hit upon in my next presentation a little bit, but right now the summer program for uh, high school is credit recovery only. Okay. Credit recovery only in the field that they did not achieve their credit in. Correct. And it's only selected courses that we can offer because there's a whole process of being, you know, that we look at the curriculums and the different vendors that we're using. So not every course that a kid has failed do we offer in summer school. There are only certain ones that they can.
protected. So this is done by computer. Their classes are done by computer. We are using online programming, yes. But the two, like I said, a lot of work goes one-on-one -on -one between the teacher and the right, student right. as they're working through it. But it's not a designated teacher sits up in front of the room and, and teaches because there might be students taking three different courses in that room at one time, and, and he or she will be moving around and helping them individually. Sounds like a virtual academy. Well, I was going to say, but how do you take phys ed online? Sorry. How did I get, but... Physical education is that's a dilemma and a conversation that's going a, a long way right now. But we do have students who have conditions that restrain them from being able to participate in physical education. Oh, I can understand that. Um, and we are kind of going in that route to give that option because right now PE is a half credit course. So if a student has to retake PE they, and they passed health, we're having trouble being able to just retake a half a credit course. So this is something that Mr. Page has approved for us to go ahead and use. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll switch seats. Put on my other hat now, and I'm going to give you an overview uh, today of Anchor Points Academy. Um, I won't reintroduce myself. Um, the objective of this particular presentation is to share with you what the history of our program has been, for those of you that don't know the history. Um, to share what our current setup is and our current program set up, uh, steps and, and things we have in place, and then uh, talk to you about an exciting future plans that we have for uh, alternative education and Anchor Points. So I'm going to start with the history of the program. It has been around in our county for many years. I arrived in the county in 2005, and I can tell you at that point, it was alternative education was something that we were uh, looking into at that time. But it was originally designed to help students with discipline issues. It was to create a place where when someone was having discipline problems or was in trouble, that they would go there. It would be, it would be helping the, the larger homeschool students would go to this particular location to try to get their education there. Um, we did for one year have what was a tri-county initiative at the Armory over at 404 and 309 where we had multiple counties together to work on an alternative school. Staffing, funding, who was in charge of which part and so forth, that didn't work out too well. It was only one year that that was tried. So about 12 years ago, Anchor Points Academy was developed. Um, there were two men that were hired to create a structured program for the system, still based around discipline issues. Um, and, and those men came in, they created what is now out back behind the Board of Education and gave it a very, very structured program atmosphere. And that's kind of what, um, you know, that, that, that's kind of where we stand at this particular point in time. I will say that right now we have shifted. We are more of an intervention for students. We are no longer a place kids are sent to because there's a problem. It's more of intervening for the students. Um, and we take students anywhere from ninth to 12th plus grades. We had students this year that were on a fifth year cohort that didn't meet everything they needed. They came and finished with us. Um, we, we were looking through graduations and we graduated somewhere between 15 and 20 students that we could count on this year that had participated in our program during their high school career. So um, it is a very important piece and it's become more of a way to intervene early and not just be a consequence for students. Our staffing structure, and you did see that the whole family was here earlier for the wards. A couple folks had to leave, but a number of the folks have stayed to be here. We do have a one position program director myself. We have five certified teachers that teach out there in four academic areas and a special educator. We have one full-time para-educator to support classrooms. We have one five-hour para-educator that supports students, because we do have students with special education needs and other learning needs out there. We are lucky right now we have a full time grant funded substance use counselor who is for the county but she is housed at our location and she helps and is able to intervene and work with students while there and you did meet earlier our three part-time grant funded transition coordinators who will not be with us at this point next year there's no funding in, uh, that we have mr kentop and can we find out how to get that grant back or um it it was a it was not a specific grant for those positions it was um through a uh, something with Mr. Engel's office and I believe the local management board and it dealt with um, uh, tobacco and substance use. Yep. Dr. Kane. That was the tobacco cessation 
um, part of that grant that we used um, these transition coordinators for. And so we got it and, you know, from time to time, local management board has opportunities that they let us know about and we partner with them. So there's no guarantee that it's the same money, but, you know, anytime there's an opportunity, they just let us know. Okay. We're currently working with them on a grant, hopefully, to be able to maintain our substance use counselor for next year. That's the first and foremost thing. But year to year, grants only last for so long you're supposed to work them into your regular budgets. They're not intended to last more than a couple of years. So now that we don't necessarily have a grant set next year for those positions. So these three part time uh, transition coordinators, they have been in your budget for a while? Or no, no, they actually, this grant year? came through in uh, March, starting in March. And it's done. And it's done, and yeah, it's done before the beginning of the next school year. We had a little bit of an extension into August, but before next school year. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, just so that you are aware, Outback, we simultaneously run two separate programs. One is the alternative program, Anchor Points. That is for students that are assigned to us, usually for a semester. Students can be assigned by the school SST team, and that is the team that has the counselors, administrators, to make a determination that a, kid, a student may need credits recovered or that their attendance issues are affecting them and they need to go somewhere where the environment will be better to help them catch up. But a student can also be placed at Anchor Points Academy by the superintendent as part of a disciplinary consequence for something that's went on. So in order to be assigned to the Anchor Points, you go through one of those two routes. That's the same time we have the alternative to suspension program, which has been a really nice uh, help for the school system in the fact that when a student gets suspended for a short term or a long term, anywhere from say three, four to 10 days for some, an event that occurs at school, they can serve a majority of their time with us as an alternative to suspension. So they're not sitting at home getting 10 days behind on their classwork. Um, and that's, we have the ability to work with them on a daily basis. We actually just had another student join us today in that particular program. Our schedule and our instructional delivery, we have a five period day we take buses both from Queen Anne's County High School and Ken Island High School. Our classes are a little bit shorter than the, the main buildings, but because we have smaller class sizes, we're able to get to the students and through the curriculums that we need to. Um, the transportation department's been a huge help. We no longer just have a bus in the morning and the afternoon. We actually have buses that come during the day from each location, because sometimes kids don't need to be there for a full day. They need a particular class at their home school because we can't offer it, and then we have a bus that brings them up. So we have buses that arrive at about 9.15 from Queen Anne's and 10 o'clock from Ken Allen to help move kids back and forth between buildings so that they can be part of, of what, to get what they need. Um, we have offered this year 23 different courses for high school credit at, out back at Anchor Points. Um, that is through those four main content areas and also through some online learning. We have offered both original credit and credit recovery. So since we have five periods, sometimes a student will get a normal four period day and then we'll work on one of their credit recoveries that they may have been missing from a previous year. So we do our best to try to increase that. We do direct instruction like you'll see at Ken Allen and Queen Anne's. We have classrooms, we have smart boards, we have activities. We do a lot of stuff with our professional development. We are not a school, but we are a school, okay? We work with the kids like a regular classroom. But at the same time, we are utilizing online learning options. So we are giving kids opportunities, especially with credit recovery, to, to work with the computers to make up some of their, um, to make some of their credits. I will say, but because of our size, you will see that we have multiple things going on at once. Teachers have anywhere between three and five preps a day because they're teaching multiple subjects. And in some classrooms, there might be simultaneous contents happening at the same time. They work with and maybe a support person or maybe the special educator and they're running both classes, um, two different curriculums at the same time. And we ensure that they get their regular coursework. Yes. And their credit recovery course. They have that option, yes. Some kids are there and they take five classes for original credit. But like we've had a couple of true freshmen this year that joined us in January. We gave them four classes and then we helped them regain a credit they missed first semester so that they could be sophomore. While studies. they're there for credit recovery, they're not falling behind on their regular that coursework. That is correct. That's that is an addition to their, their original, like, yes. That's it's an addition. a requirement yes. basically and their yes. credit recovery. Yes. Um, the last four years, just to give you an update, we served 59 students during 2015 and 16. In 2016 and 17, there were 68. Last year, we had 50, and then this year, we have 57. As I said, we just actually had one join us this week for alternative suspension. 
as that's I just, not all year. That's just certain times of the year. That's all we year. We had 56 individual entries. Entrances. Yes, correct. Some and some of those kids have entered a couple of others. times. Yes. They may have come first. But they first. still only count once. They only count once, yes. They may have spent a short term in the fall and then came in the spring to be with and us. And that's where that can be deceiving because your numbers don't change, but there's a body in that classroom perhaps three months later that's the same person but doesn't get an extra counted Correct. person. Correct. Correct. So to say the enrollment varies, it certainly does. It does but we aren't getting credit for in, if they do have more than one attendance. And that, we, we don't want to period. twist the data that way. Right. So if a student's there multiple right. times, we're talking students who we're serving, so. Right. Probably no time that those schools are go that school is going empty. No, yes. no, we are not going empty. <laughs> yes. Uh, some additional structures and supports that we have in place. Um, as I said, we are not technically a school, but we do treat it as a school. And there have been things that we've put in into place over the last two years. We are now doing student of the month recognitions. Our students are traditionally students that may have never been recognized. Um, and we on a monthly basis have been able to recognize them. And it's not a made up recognition, it's a true recognition if they are showing growth or they are showing academic determination. We've also instituted barbershop and beauty shop talks this year with our students. This is an opportunity to essentially, as the name says, be like you're in a barbershop and have topics of discussion where kids just need to talk about things. The first time we did it, we actually had a barber who volunteered to come in right before the winter holiday and gave haircuts to our boys before they went home for the break. But we sit and we have conversations. We talk about things like we've talked about Title IX. We've talked about different things that just sometimes you can't do in a normal classroom. So we have instituted those this year. We are a PBIS school. We have been a gold school for a number of, or excuse me, gold program for a number of years. Um, we do have incentives on a monthly basis. I do want to give a, a huge thank you to the Ken Island Elks. They have funded and supported our PBIS program through next year. They just got in touch with us and they funded our program for all of next year. So I appreciate that support. We also try to interact with as many outside wraparound agencies as we can. So we do work with DJS caseworker who will come over and meet with students and I communicate on a regular basis with. We have mental health therapists who come and meet with students at our location. We have a great relationship with the Centerville Police Department. I will tell you the Centerville Police Department visits our program more to come over and say hi and check on the kids than they do because we call them to come over for something. And that is a change of the history of that program too. It used to be a much different relationship. Um, and we also have the benefit of an opportunity youth worker and that is through a grant that's Ms. Hearn and she works with some of our students as she does with other students uh, across the uh, county. Weekly, we go to recess over at Centerville Elementary School. We give our students a chance to be the role models for the younger kids. Um, some of the hardest of kids get in front of some second graders and get down on their knees and start drawing with chalk or playing kickball with kids. And it's a great opportunity for our students. And one of the things I think we are most proud of is on a monthly basis, we have a family meal with our students. And that is something that we do as adults. We cook the food, we bring it in, and we sit down with them and we all just eat. We've done formal Thanksgiving meals and so forth, and we've had fun tailgating pizza days. So um, it just helps to build a relationship with our kids. <coughs> Some steps that we're taking to improve our program. Last year, I was able to attend the National Alternative Education Conference. Um, it was very eye-opening to see some of the things that are out there. I've also visited two Baltimore County programs, Wicomico County's program and Howard County's program to see how their alternative programs run. I also had a meeting with Caroline County's representative. They came here and I've met with the representative from MSDE. Last year we had Saving Lives Incorporated complete a thorough program evaluation. I believe somewhere in like the March time frame I gave the board uh, the presentation and the findings on that, um, that that you could look at on those to help us kind of really structure our program better. And the bottom line at this point is it's time for this program to evolve. We need to evolve our alternative education program in Queen Anne's County. One of the things that's neat, APA students are now there primarily for academic reasons. It's not behavior and discipline anymore. There are attendance issues and there are behavior issues. Don't get me wrong, it is not perfect out back. There's not unicorns and rainbows. We have difficult kids who have problems, but it's academic problems that are being impacted and that's what we try to address. Some students have requested to stay with us. When their semesters are over, we give them input into where they, what they think is best for them. We've had a number of students that request to stay because the environment for them is better. It's smaller, it's a little more personal. Not that anything's wrong in either of the home schools, but for them, it just works out as a better environment. And really, what is a new thing for Anchor Points is we have staff that are requesting to transfer in. 
to anchor points, and that's good. When we have people that want to come in and work with the students that need that most help, it's nice to have that. So I want to share with you a rebranding opportunity for our Queen Anne's County Public Schools Alternative Program. Anchor Points Academy served its purpose for the last 12 years, uh, but it does have a community perception as a place where the bad kids go. And that is not just the community, unfortunately, it's within our system. Some of our even teachers say, yeah, that's where the problem kids go. Um, I would have proposed to the executive team and the superintendent that we move and we are now the Arise Academy. Um, it is really a true alternative program meeting a variety of needs, academic, attendance, behavioral, whatever is needed for a kid. So when someone sees Arise Academy, they might be wondering what that stands for. This acronym is really what we consider our five tenets of what's important, achievement first. That's gotta be first and foremost for our students, but relationships are just as important. In this day and age, innovation has to play a huge part in moving our kids forward. We believe that our, our children, our students need to learn service of putting others before themselves. And very, very important over the last two years has been endurance. And that's real, our word has been grit, teaching kids to work through and get through the problems that they might have. So we're proposing to go that way. We have been working off of this mission statement. Um, and that really is that we are providing a structured nurturing environment where students whose needs are best met in a non-traditional school setting can come to build their relationships, develop positive academic behaviors, learn to serve their community, develop grit, and achieve academic success that's gonna to lead to productive post-secondary experiences. I will tell you, my son graduated last week. I saw several of you there. I was extremely happy that my son graduated, but I was just as happy to run into so many of our kids from Anchor Points that were there. I, we really do love those kids, and we wanna see them succeed. One of the big picture items that you need to know is, I'm talking about Anchor Points tonight or the Arise Academy, but alternative education is a huge umbrella of things for this county. And the Anchor Points or the Arise Academy is just one part of it. We are looking to really push forward and expand our alternative education. We can start including more options for our home and hospital teaching students that we are currently working with. We have the homeschooling population out there with the virtual academy that is gonna fall under this umbrella of things that are coming up. We've already talked about the credit recovery summer school program, but we haven't talked about advanced courses. The ability to do online learning for courses that students might not be able to get, and this is where your original credit question comes in, they might not be able to get at our, our schools because we don't offer them right now, but alternative education, might, we might find alternatives digitally or in other ways to be able to support them. And to be quite truthfully, I don't know what else is next for alternative education. We've been having the conversation that of we see a vision of five or 10 years down the road, but my goodness, 10 years from now, this presentation I just gave might look archaic to what's actually out there for alternative education. So in conclusion, I just want to say that alternative education is evolving. Anchor Points has evolved with it. And right now, public perception and branding is going to be so important to our growth. Questions? I have a few questions. OK. So the first right off the bat is, why is this not a school? Would you like me to try to address that, or do you want to address that? I mean, it's, it's not a difficult answer. And you have to be, I'm going to say uh, this term loosely, sort of registered with the state to, and have a school number in order to be considered a school. And there are certain things that make a school a school. It has to have an administrator. It has to have teachers. It has, there are certain things that schools have to have. We don't have full service at anchor points at this point. It is a program for us, and students are still members of, or enrolled in their home school, but they come here to anchor points for various reasons, mostly for credit recovery, um, and then they go back. So in order to be a school, we'd have to have a school number. We'd have to meet several other requirements that the state makes for uh, to be considered a school. Is that a possibility down the road with this growth? Um, you know, we have had some conversations about that, and we'll have to look a little bit closer to that. Um, part of the issue with that is that then you own your own um, test scores and all of those kinds of things. And with students um, that are already behind in credits, sometimes that means that they are scoring lower on, on their tests. And so when you concentrate that into one place, then you're faced with a school that may be considered failing in certain different areas. And we really need to look closely um, and consider a lot of things before we even consider doing that. Mm -hmm. As it stands, because those students attend school at Anchor Points, their test scores stay with their home school. And so instead of being one of 10 or 20 who's graduating, they're one of 
250, 300 that are graduating, and the school scores can their scores can be absorbed in a, a greater population. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's it's a lot to be considered. Well, and their enrollment stays with their home school, correct? That is correct. Yes, that which is, is I think important when we have students who may come and go for various reasons. Um, we wouldn't want to lose them from their home school enrollment just to count them in another um, building and then take it away again. It's two back and forth. I mean, this is pretty consistent. They're counted, they're counted one time, but they're not stuck in a program that they're not getting what they need. Correct. They and, have and, this and I have visited larger programs that are schools, but those are much larger counties where the populations right. are much larger right. in those things. So that has or to be weighed. Or tri-county areas. Yeah, well, and you have to weigh that because yeah. th that is a very true, we love our kids, but our kids are struggling and needing lots of help. And there are things that would get flagged in if you, when, when they're all together like that. Well, what I could, the possibilities I see here is to be able to teach a population of kids who can't learn traditionally. Right who would benefit from an out-of-the-box experience that you may be able to offer as a school instead of losing these kids to, say, Wide River Upper School who, are, who can't pay tuition right. and are losing out on an opportunity. And so part of the reason for the rebranding is to, one, get rid of the stigma. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to take time. But two, so that we can really provide for students the service that they need. They don't have to be a part of this anchor points or a rise doesn't have to be a school with a bona fide school number in order to provide those services. And we're looking at some online options and have already delved into some online opportunities because every student is not fit for a traditional high school. But what we can do is we can think about what can we do to ensure that students who um, you know, are at anchor points or rise and would like to stay there because they just don't. We have that situation, you know. We some have students, students with say just high anxiety. do not want to go back. You know, high right. anxiety right. issues that they can't even walk into the building when they're at the large, the large. So but not us. necessarily at the numbers that could sustain its uh, own. Correct, and that's stuff. why I said that's the same as that's and a in big a way system, that's a benefit system. to our smaller group that is in this secluded, um, not secluded, but this. Um, more attention, personalized, yes, personalized, personalized environment that they can get what they need mm -hmm. without jeopardizing the loss of a school or other numbers from another school. I mean, I fully support this program, and I know there's been talk in the past about it being very expensive, but in my opinion, when children need special things, the dollar amount no, is That's right. it's the not about most the money important that thing. Right. Yeah. And when when you see that stigma change, I can see your numbers rising. Well, like I said, we're already seeing students that want to be a part of the program. We've even had kids come for a short-term ATS whose parents afterwards have called the board and said, how can I get my kid there <laughs> type of thing. And I mean, that's a good problem to have, but it's, it's part of the long-term vision of where we might be able to take this. When they come out of your school and they're home base at Queen Anne's or Ken Allen, they graduate from Ken Allen Queen Anne's. Yes. So basically, you're just support, call it technical or whatever support, for them to go a different avenue, but at the end of the day, 12th grade, whenever they get there, they graduate with a Queen right. Anne. We're, we're like an annex for both schools. Right. They can send the kids there, we teach the same stuff, but it's a little different environment, and then we send them back so that they can graduate. So is this um, a rise, it's something that you're planning on doing now? It is. You know, there are some, um, we need to look closely, and I know Mr. Um, Kentop has at regulations or policies with regard to naming of school buildings and this meets all the qualifications so we're okay there but yes yeah, so we certainly um, have done a lot of homework on it looking at opportunities to expand change the stigma that is attached to it and offer more opportunities for students um, and yes we are looking to change that my name. only my only recommendation recommendation is in your mission statement the word grit is i think it strength of character fortitude something you know i i I grew up in it, or Eastern Shore. We call it grit. We call it grit with our kids. Our kids know what grit okay. is. <laughs> but some parents may not. But you know, in the, in the classrooms of the kids, you, you're getting your grit on. So grit is a, a widely used term now. Yeah. Um, it's an educational yeah. word. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I, I wrote it down. Thank you.
But in that respect, is just changing the name going to help us oh, to yeah. get rid of no, the stigma? No, the name, the name is it's step start. one. I have a, I have a graphic uh, artist who is a former parent from a school that I was at who's working up some publicity stuff for us. We want to go, we want to be able to have brochures about our program that be, can be given out. We, we really want to get out into the community, really. That's the more important thing. One of the things you saw in there was service. We want our kids next year as part of their service that we're out at different functions at schools where they might be the escorts helping people find right. where to go right. and they are wearing something that says they're from Arise Academy because they want, we're proud of it. You know, we want them to be proud of it. We want the name out there that it's a I good agree, place. but I don't have any problem calling it Anchor Points Academy because I don't put a stigma to that oh. knowing how it's evolved. Um, and you are unfortunately in the minority in that yeah, particular yeah, case. But, right. but again, everyone in this community is still going to know well, what right. draws children it's to that cross. school. The name change to me is it's a start. Well, if you think it's going to work, I mean, you're the guts behind it, mm -hmm. and you're making it successful. And we just have to go from there and each year make it, you know. And our, our you know, society's changing. There are many more and more on these school systems all the time, and that's why, you know, some of this stuff is being put upon us. And I think this thing's a great thing so kids don't fall through the cracks and can get out with a high school education from oh, either Queen Anne's or Kent County. I don't have any problem with that. It's just I don't. And this is no, the honestly, this is no significant anything to the system, a cost or any of those types of things. It really is about 12 years of a reputation that just by name, even folks in our own school system, we're going to get out to like the schools at the beginning of the year and talk to the <coughs> faculty, and we're going to be sharing a lot of this with them. So it really is a public, uh, a publicity campaign, not just a name change. Yes. Congratulations. Well, that's, that's I think, my point. Yeah. It has to be. Yes. The name change is irrelevant. Uh, correct. Irrelevant. Absolutely correct. But I had one thing is, is I think we should somehow aggressively go after uh, grant grant money for because the impact those three people had on you, you don't even know how much impact they had, how many kids they have they have uh, affected, and even one kid is worth it. And um, if we can push that grant program, it would help you to increase your staff. And the other thing I'd like to recognize, the staff is all sitting right there. And Thank you they all do very all much. Well do done. Work, if you yeah. could just raise your hand up who you're... Yeah. yeah Thank that's you all very, very much. <laughs> is, is red the color of the school, too? Is that why you're all in there? <laughs> that's a long story. You don't want to hear <laughs> okay, how okay. we got the red tonight. It's okay. <laughs> There's just not enough beer here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your, your hard work. And, and before you leave, though, Mr. Kentop, I do want to say that you're correct. The, the, it's not just about the name. The name will represent that school and, and what it aspires to be. Aspire. Um, but this is about the people. This is about the students that we just cannot afford, not one single one of them, to um, allow them to fail. Uh, because they don't have the traditional supports in place and not only our students as I say the people but the people who are sitting in front of us and their colleagues who are on the ground every day supporting those students they are in their homes wherever their homes might be they're on their jobs if they have one they're looking for them when they don't come to school they are ensuring that they get what they need and they're in, and you're absolutely right we said this a lot last year there is no dollar amount that we can attach to the value that the service we're providing has for our students. Um, you know, we'll support them if they are incarcerated, we'll support them if they are not. It just doesn't matter, but we just can't let them fall. And I want to thank Mr. Kentop for his leadership because that is making a humongous difference <coughs> in making a, a change uh, and removing some barriers for kids who would be left behind without a doubt. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And you said incarcerated. We did have a student who just yes. graduated from yes, one of our did. schools who unfortunately couldn't make graduation because he's incarcerated, but we got him finished while he was in prison. Uh, we can't let our students become statistics. Nope. And that's what I think we all are here supporting you, you support them. We're, we're supporting our kids. So thank, thank you. you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Hello again. 
The next presentation will um, cover our title grant programs. And the purpose of our program, or the purpose of the presentation is to give you an overview of the grants awarded to Queen Anne's County Public Schools, to also give you an overview of how the funds can be utilized, and then how they are being utilized. By the end of this presentation, um, you will have a better understanding of Title I, Title IIA, Title III, Title IV, and the Perkins CTE grants and how they are used to improve student success. So, um, and I'm, we can introduce ourselves when we come to our grants, if that's cool. So again, my name is Susan Walbert, and I have the pleasure of uh, being attached to Title I. Title I Part A provides financial assistance to local education agencies and schools with high numbers or high percentage of children from low-income families to ensure that all children meet challenging state academic standards. I included our Title I statistics uh, there, and you can see Southersville Elementary, Southersville Middle, Graysonville Elementary, and Churchill Elementary are our Title I schools, and those are their, um, the levels of free and reduced students in each one of those schools. I included our non-Title I schools so that you can see the difference between um, the, the levels of um, poverty in, in those schools. So how can we use these funds? Uh, last year, or this current school year, we were awarded $882,000. The schools are charged with uh, having a, uh, creating a comprehensive needs assessment. So they look at all their data and they look at their needs. They, de they then develop a plan the plan uh, must have a huge emphasis on parent engagement because we know how important that is. And then we attach dollars to what their plan is. I, uh, you'll see supplement, not supplant. Um, it's very important that all of these title dollars are supplemental. So we like to think of it as um, a cupcake and, we're, and our grants are the icing on top. So how do we um, utilize our funds? The schools um, have additional staffing to implement interventions and reduce class sizes. Our schools each have extended, uh, well, two of our schools have extended day programs. All of our schools have extended year programs. So that was the, the summer um, programs that we just talked about. We hired a parent and family engagement specialist who is doing a phenomenal job um, reaching out and building that bridge between our, our um, schools and our families. We have a bilingual family engagement liaison that supports our English uh, learning families. We do a lot of parent education. We have stipends for collaboration to support our teachers to have additional time to collaborate. There are enrichment opportunities for our students. We have some homeless funds that are set aside and then we also are required to do some um, non-public um, funds. Any questions about Title I? You don't, you don't have a large non-public population. We don't have any, we don't have any at all. Okay. We, we are required to um, invite all of our um, non-public placements to come in, but no one, sometimes they will um, look for professional development opportunities that we can actually provide with them coming to us and, and getting that professional development. But as of right now, we don't have anybody that, that, um, that requests dollars. What would they do? I don't, I don't understand, these are private school folks? So, so Title I funds can be, are supposed to be set aside for those students. So if, if there is a student who normally would attend, we'll just pick Southersville Elementary for, for um, just as an example. If that student would normally attend Southersville Elementary and they're attending a private placement, that private school can be allotted dollars because that student is, is originally a Title I student. Does that make sense? So they come to the meetings and they share their um, concerns or, or where they would like to, you know, have dollars. And it, it's not like we just hand them, you know, here's, here's a bucket of money. It, um, there's formulas and things that, that are, and most of the time it is possibly a, um, it might be a tutor. They, they might um, inquire about a tutor. And I'm only going from um, Talbot County, our neighboring county um, has a couple large non-public placements and, um, and a lot of Title I schools. So, so they do work, and maybe Title I would pay for a tutor to go into one of their um, non-public placements. Okay. And professional development is, is a large one, too. They often ask for dollars for professional development. This is just Title I? Yes, they would have to be in, have originally to in a Title I school, yes. 
So Ms. Passon um, is our Title IIA contact person. She couldn't be here tonight. She apologizes. She wasn't feeling well. So I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about Title IIA. <coughs> um, the purpose of this grant is to provide uh, dollars to state educational agencies and subcontracts to local education agencies to increase uh, student achievement consistent with challenging state academic standards, improve the quality and effectiveness of teachers, principals, and other school leaders, increase the number of teachers, principal, and other school leaders who are effective in improving student academic achievement in schools, and to provide low-income and minority students greater access to effective teachers, principals, and other school leaders. FY19, we were awarded, and you see the dollar amount that was awarded for Title IIA. What Queen Anne's County has done with those dollars is uh, we have two teachers um, that are assigned uh, for reduction in class sizes. One teacher is at Centerville Elementary and the other one is um, at Southerville uh, Elementary. 11% of that money went to professional development, uh, teachers attending national content conferences or AP summer institutes. 7% um, went to administrator and supervisor in school professional development. It was um, our equity professional development. And then 3% went to teacher recruitment. Guess what? Title III is me too. <laughs> um, so Title III dollars, the purpose of, of Title III is to help ensure that our English learners attain English language proficiency and meet state academic standards. Currently, we have 309 English learners in our county. Um, we get about $30,000, so it's, it's a small supplemental grant, but it, but it certainly does help. Um, it helps us to enhance instruction, um, provide professional development, increase our parent engagement. One thing that it cannot be used for is interpretation or translation. We have an additional tutor that we use um, um, those dollars for. We have some extended school year tutors. Um, we act, um, have professional development that's for our EL teachers and tutors, additional materials, and we also had a, um, you know, we to access is the state testing that our, um, that our ELs take to find out their measure of language acquisition, and we had a successful parent night so that our parents could understand what those access scores mean. Not me. Okay. Want to trade places? Sure. Thank you, Susan. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. I did have one more question before you go, Ms. Well, um, I'm stay. On the Title II, as I recall, we, there was a point years ago we were trying to use that money for something else, but we were only allowed to. And my understanding, it was mostly professional development. Mm -hmm. Your slide shows 70, we have two extra teachers. So how does that differ from one? So, so I'm going to... I'm going to, I might turn because this is, this one's not my grant, but I'm going to try to answer your question. There, there are different things that, that you can use the dollars for and class reduction is one of those. I do know that, and, and uh, Mr. Pluski, if you want to jump in, I do know that, that we are looking at, um, at how we're going to use those dollars um, currently. I don't know if the, if the class reduction will continue or not. And, and traditionally, a lot of school districts will use Title II funds for that exact reason to reduce class size. So as you know, when we've gone through our staffing and there's a great need to reduce, uh, we're able to use grant funds to be able to do that. And that's, that's a huge benefit. Um, but as you could see, if we picked up that locally, then that frees up um, a tremendous amount of money that would go back in to be used specifically for a variety of targeted reasons across the district. So it is allowable. Uh, it's something that we've used in practice. Uh, again, this is back to how do you use all your resources available uh, to reduce class size, uh, to be able to improve, um, as we know, instructional practice that goes back to um, you know, a smaller number of students. I guess the danger in that is, is if the grant isn't there, and maybe that was our problem, if the grant wasn't there, um, then you can't keep the teachers. I mean, it's supposed to be a one-shot deal as a grant. And Title II funds, you know, nationally have been reduced. And here in Maryland, we've had a significant reduction in our Title II funds over the last two years, few years. Um, but we've still maintained this, obviously, as a priority. Okay. It's a good question. Okay. Captain Kelly, board members, Dr. Kane, Mr. Paluski, executive team. I'm Michael Bell. I'm the supervisor of Visual and Performing Arts, World Languages and Media. And 
Title IV Part A is what I'm going to be sharing with you today. It's also known as the Student Support and Academic Achievement Enrichment Grants. Uh, it's a formula-based grant that provides funds through the state to provide students with access to basically three big buckets, a well-rounded education, improved school conditions for learning, and improved use of technology in order to improve academic achievement. And the breakdown of the federal distribution of those funds uh, for July 1st, 2018 to June 30th of 2020 are as follows. And for each of those three major buckets, to break it down a little further for everyone, in part one, which is well-rounded, uh, we are introducing equity teaching teams, which have been established and trained at four focus schools to build capacity for cultural proficiency and equity work. And that aims uh, to increase efficacy with all the stakeholders in the areas of assessing cultural knowledge, value and diversity, managing dynamics of difference. In part two, Part two is where we're putting equity systems in place to improve school conditions for student learning. And this is where we're addressing very complex challenges uh, through this phase, which is designed to establish a deeper understanding of how to use successful schools framework tools to increase teacher and student capacity for our equity work across all levels. And in the third bucket, which I'm very, very proud to announce uh, that for the very first time in the history of Queen Anne's County, uh, next year we're going to be providing students college and career ready access to AP Studio Art courses for the very first time in AP Drawing, AP 2D, as well as AP 3D. So in order to do this, we have to provide training for our teachers um, to develop their technical skills. There's a digital learning component uh, and there's a digital submission uh, component to the AP portfolio. So we'll be sending teachers to AP training this summer for that work. So those are the, uh, the three big buckets for Title IV Part A. Jabal, do you find a, a, uh, a need for it, a, a request for these AP drawings? Studio Art and 3D, you're seeing a, a large, I mean, you're seeing an increase in the students asking for this? Yes, well, we're just in the process right now of revamping the entire uh, visual arts <coughs> curriculum so that it aligns in scope and sequence in, in a way where it scaffolds from a level one course that leads to an AP course for the first time. And this provides students access to some tremendous scholarship opportunities and it levels the playing field. Uh, also there's, develops their art. Yeah, there, and, and there's other districts out there that have had AP Studio Art for 20 years. So we're bringing it for the first time and we're bringing it hard and fast and we already have students signed up for it and they're really excited. And if you were at Art Scene, many of those students that had these tremendous portfolios on display, they, they could have easily passed the AP portfolio this year. They're ready. Those teachers have them ready, we just didn't have the courses in place. Now we do. So. so this will help them with their college career. Oh, big time. It's exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. Okay, and I'll turn over to Title It's a little Plus confusing, B. though. That, I mean, uh, I was associated these extra grant for title, one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. I was associated with, I don't remember four, honestly, but I associated it with um, needy children. But so four is a completely different animal. Big. They actually, when they came out with four, they kind of called it the kitchen sink grant because it, it can cover lots of different things. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. My <coughs> name is Kim Omberger. I'm the program director for the Partnering for Youth After School program. We serve um, ten, county, 10 schools in the county. Uh, this past year, we have um, had 1,062 children participate from 500. 859 families. So tonight I get to present Title IV, Part B, part of the kitchen sink, I guess. <laughs> but it's been around for a little while. It's actually been around since 2000, um, actually 1997, I'm going to say. Um, this is better known as Title IV, Part B, is better known as the 21st Century Community Learning Center Program. And this program is the um, only 
federal funding source dedicated exclusively for after school programs, before school programs, and summer learning programs. So it's, it's a big, big deal for after school programs. This initiative is currently funded at the federal level at $1.2 million, and it's been recommended by the House that it is going to increase $100 million in the 2020 budget. We'll see if that happens. Each state receives these funds based on the same formula that um, they use for Title I funding. The Maryland State Department of Education distributes the state allocation through a competitive grant process grant support out of school time programs for students attending school-wide Title I uh, schools or schools that have 40% or more of free and reduced meals participation. Uh, the Queen Anne's County Board of Education won a competitive 21st Century Community Learning Center grant to serve Churchill, Graysonville, and Southersville Elementary Schools for three years. This year was the first year of the funding cycle. The 21st Century Grant is um, implemented by Partnering for Youth. There are um, basically five major components to a 21st CCLC program, and that is academics, enrichment activities, service learning, character education, and family education. The 21st CCLC Grant funds after school expenses like instructional salaries, coordinator salaries, a percentage of the program salaries, fringe benefits, professional development training, transportation, supplies and materials, program evaluations, and indirect business support. Partnering for Youth has proposed and developed and implemented eight 21st century grants for Queen Anne's County since 2001. The current funding is $390,000 each year for three years. However, this is what they call a continuation grant, and that means that you have to apply for your second and third year funding, and it is awarded based on your progress to outcomes. This past year, we served 191 children from 161 families at Churchill, Graysonville, and Southern Elementary Schools um, we call the project Project A to Z. The program took place for 30 weeks out of the school year, and the attendance averaged 93% against a goal of 90%. So when we consulted with the schools about um, partnering for youth, doing the academic piece, it was decided that we would focus on math intervention. So we use a program called Dreambox Learning. This program um, is uh, given to students. Students are invited to come and uh, get a boost in math by participating in the program and using this online um, intervention that provides individualized instruction at levels to their level. And uh, the students actually think that they're playing games and solving puzzles on the computer, but actually they're learning. They're using a very in-depth program that adjusts the lesson sequence, difficulty, and pace in real time. So actually, they just think it's fun. So that's a good part, they're learning. The enrichment activities are developed by the PFY staff. Uh, when writing the grant proposal, we chose a health and wellness competitive priority. So all of them are written with that in mind. Uh, for previous grants, we had a STEM priority, and we are not willing to let that go. So so fast, so we're kind of combining our STEM and our health and wellness um, priority. An example of that would be cardio fit is our uh, fitness activity. And uh, what we do in cardio fit is we teach children the science supporting health and that, that's specifically cardiovascular health. So they receive a brief lesson and then they're on to a physical activity for about 45 minutes. We've also embraced social emotional learning to provide children with the emotional, interpersonal, and cognitive skills and strategies to get them ready to learn something and get them ready to get through to the rest of their lives. So this year, um, the other component, the family workshops, we had two family events um, at each of the schools to um, help parents understand social emotional learning the first event, we explained what it was and gave them some strategies to use at home. The second event, 
Uh, we showed them how the SEL was being used in the activities, and specifically the acting activity that was offered this spring. So they then watched um, their children perform in three short plays. And uh, the post-evaluations of the acting out event, when they were asked if there were any behavioral changes in their, that they've noticed in their children, since this is part of our program now, they commented that the improve, they saw improvements in confidence, attitude, motivation, and social awareness. So we're pretty happy about that. Just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about this um, funding source tonight. And do you have any questions for me? I'm looking on this chart, pie chart for Perkins allotment and program enrollment. Is this based financial based on the county's wealth? That's, that, that that's would be, be Adam. Yep. Oh, next. I'm yep. sorry. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Your question, Kim, your PFY program in uh, non-Title I schools, so that's a totally different grant. You it's a lot of grants. A lot of we grants. just put a bunch of funding sources together and see what we can offer, <coughs> so it's a lot okay. of different grants. Thank you. All right. Good evening, Captain Kelly, Dr. Kane, members of the board. My name is Adam Tolley. I am supervisor of career and technology education and social studies, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the Perkins Grant, which is the main funding mechanism for career and technology education in the United States. So recently, uh, last July, the president uh, re-signed, uh, the Perkins Grant was reauthorized. The new official title is Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century, uh, and it's collectively uh, referred to as the Perkins Five Grant. Uh, I didn't put this in the slide, but recently in April, uh, the local CT directors from the five upper school counties had an opportunity to go to a presentation uh, at Chesapeake College um, put on by a gentleman named Michael Brewstein, and he is, uh, I guess I would refer to him, and most would refer to him as the, the Perkins guru. He works with um, school districts in, in, I believe, about 35 states. Um, so I was invited and I uh, reached out to Mr. Fister uh, to, to attend as well to this presentation and, and he was able to attend along with uh, Jen Boda and, I, and it was a very um, enlightening presentation. Uh, he was very, very well versed in Perkins and just some of the new changes that um, are going into effect beginning in uh, July of 2019. Uh, some of the, really the main focus of the, the new Perkins grant is um, all about workforce development, workforce need, how are we uh, identifying what the workforce needs are in, in the counties, in the school systems, in the districts in the United States, and then after we identify them, how are we developing programs, how are we um, preparing our students to meet those workforce needs. So that's, that's really the, the main overarching theme of, of Perkins and Perkins 5 is really kind of putting more of a, a laser-like focus on, on that. So one of the other uh, highlights, too, if you look at the, the next to last bullet, is that traditionally um, prior to this reauthorization, funding was not allowed to be used below grade 7. Um, and now moving ahead after this next transition year, funding will be able to be used in the middle grades, which is uh, considered to be 5 to 8 for career exploration. So we are really going to to take a look at that and what we can do to um, give opportunities to our students to explore opportunities for careers in the in the element the upper elementary and middle school levels. I'm going to jump ahead one, and then I'll come back to that actual funding structure. So, put together just two two pie charts, and th these um, charts basically represent uh, the chart on the left is the Perkins allotment for the counties, the nine counties on the eastern shore, and then the chart on the right shows the actual program enrollment, and so you can and sort of do a sort of do a comparison of, of what that looks like. Um, when you look at our slice of the pie versus the other counties, and then you compare that to our enrollment, so it does appear that we have, we have high enrollment but a small slice of that pie and it is when we go when we go back at the main portion of the funding formula 70 percent of that is based on um, income level and since Queen Anne's County higher income level lower amount of funding and when you look at um, 
comparable county, uh, neighboring county, Talbot County, they are in the, they are in the same situation. Their funding is is relatively within a few thousand dollars uh, of ours. So that's how it works. Even though we have a a high number of students that are going through our CT programs, um, the funding is not from the federal government is not there to to kind of mirror what that looks like, unfortunately. <laughs> and again, I just put the you know I put the nine Eastern Shore counties on here just as a comparison to see to see where we stand. And when you look at some of the the larger counties on on the Western Shore, obviously they have larger populations and they get a, a and again it varies based on income level in the county, but they may receive a much larger portion of the funding. Even though we run many of the same programs they do, they they're able to to do different things with their programs based just based upon this Perkins funding. I'd like to know why the counties that get so much of an allotment and use so little of it don't get readjusted. We've got two of them. And it's, and it's based on, and it's the federal government's formula, and, then, and what they do is basically pay, they, each of the states receive a, a piece of that overall, um, overall slice, and then they give it out to the counties based upon Regardless that. Regardless whether they use it or not. They're, they well, use it. I'm saying at that, you know, at the enrollment level that would sure, match the giving. Sure. Um, and, and Comico and Somerset. Mm -hmm. And even though it is a, it's a formula-based grant, it is it is monitored um, very heavily. The the actual application for the Perkins grant is very extensive. It, it takes quite a long time to put together, um, and it has to be it's 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 scrutinized by this by the state because they have to answer to the federal government. So the the counties go through a, a you know pretty extenuous process to get to get the money. Even each though each county have a little flexibility on what it can do for the program, where it's a standard program for each county has to offer the same criteria. They they there, there is flexibility with within the grant as far as what they do, and and when we look at you know what what we do, um, you know the the main overarching guidance on the grant is that we have to use it for program upgrade. So we have to be able to improve our programs. Um, Consumable materials, and you know, just put a couple examples in here, are not allowed to be used for the grant. So our carpentry program, we cannot buy lumber for that because it's a consumable um, um, material. When we look at and we we compare the when just knowing how the other counties spend their money, thirty-two thousand. So about half of our money is used on student certifications and site licenses, and I'll and I'll kind of jump ahead. Um, and this is something that that I think is. You know, which is why I put the exclamation point here, which is something that uh, I think is a, a great service that we offer to our students, is that we pay for all student certification exams and licenses. Many of the other counties do not do that. They, they, the burden falls on the students, and in many cases, it's, it's extremely expensive. So when you look at the, the certified clinical medical assistant exam costs, and that's just one, one piece of our nursing program, it's $155 per student. And we use their our Perkins dollars to to pay for that because you know I think that it, really the the Perkins grant and the CT programs one of the the biggest pieces of that is being able to provide a technical certification for students and you know for to, to tell a student that you have to pay you know to, to give them the program and then for them to have to pay $155 for certification is difficult so I, I'm proud of the fact that we were able to do that for our students. Um, and for for all the programs that we have for the nursing program for the cosmetology program all these certification it goes on the construction programs we we pay the bill for for those programs and it does vary by program but we are able to do that so they're getting out, they're getting out certified in whatever thing they did to show that they have a qualification to meet yes sir yep so when they when they come out of whatever program it is and I'll and I'll use um, nursing for example our students that come out of our nursing program have the opportunity to have three certifications, um, and, and we pay for all those certifications. So when they when they graduate, whatever they decide to do, if they decide to go on to post secondary education or go right into um, the workforce, they are prepared. They have that certification. Not just a diploma; they got something certified in a certain field to in their hand. That is that is recognized. You know that we we are certified by the Maryland. Our program is certified by the Maryland Board of Nursing. So they're certified to go anywhere in Maryland, but they can certainly probably take that certification to other states. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that's that's recognized. And, and when we look at other programs, we're increasing our certification in our business program that's been going for a couple of years, and we've brought that back this year on a small scale. Next year, we're bringing it back on a full scale. So students, uh, we're going to have a 
a site license that allows 500 certifications, 500 students to take exams uh, and receive Microsoft Office certification. So rather than, you know, when they put together a resume that says they are proficient in Microsoft Word, they can actually say that they are certified in various parts of Microsoft Word. So, I mean, do we do some plumbing, electrical, or everything? We have, yeah, so we have carpentry, welding, yep, so they, we provide certification <coughs> there as well. So. We recognize each group at graduation, too, okay. that and, and we hope, and, and it's our hope, to increase the certifications in, in all of our programs. So we want to we want to be able to offer that opportunity in every single one of our CT programs. One of the newer programs um, that we we offered certifications for this year was our Homeland Security program, and with a with a focus on GIS, which is geographical information systems. So students have a chance to take, and that's the first time that's been offered. And we are actually the only the only county on the shore that offers that program and certification. So. It's exciting, I think. That was Perkins in three or four minutes. Any any questions? Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Good evening, Captain Kelly, members of the board, Dr. Kane. My name is Carla Pullen. I'm the facilities planner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And tonight I'm here to discuss with you the educational facilities master plan and the draft document that we have prepared for 2019. Tonight we wanna to look at the role of the educational facilities master plan in our state construction funding process. We'll also discuss the schedule for this year's submission for the 2019 Educational Facilities Master Plan. I want to provide you a quick outline of the draft version of the plan that we have this evening. And at the July 10th meeting is when we'll be asking for your final approval of this so that we can submit to the state. The annual, annual capital improvement program, this is what predicates our state construction funding. And it's a two-step process. So the first part of this is the Educational Facilities Master Plan that I'm talking with you about tonight. And this is, uh, the oversight of this is through the Maryland Department of Planning. So it's a long range plan that looks out many years. We do yearly updates every year. Um, it looks at a lot of our enrollment projections to see where the county is going to be in future years. We then prioritize our facility needs and we look at necessary future projects. This is really looking at the school system as a whole and what our future needs are going to be. The second part of that construction funding formula is the capital improvement plan, and that's what we do in the fall. And that looks at the upcoming fiscal year. It projects out for future years, typically seven future years. We start to establish timelines for each of our projects. We also prioritize the needs there and then we outline what funding we are gonna need from the local entity and from the state entity. And this, the capital improvement plan is the part that really breaks down the dollars needed. The educational facilities master plan, it's a law, it's written in Comar. It's outlined Title 23, Subtitle 03, Chapter 02, under Point 02, the local educational facilities master plan. And it tells us in Comar what information we need to include every year. <coughs> it's essentially a master plan. It has to be board approved. And therefore, that's why I'm here this evening to get that process started for 2019. The components of our master plan were required to include a cover and an introduction. The first section is educational goals, standards, and guidelines. This is essentially we outline the mission, we outline the vision, we look at the core values of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. We also outline the method for instruction and the different programs that we offer here in our school system. We look at staffing needs, we discuss 
career and technology education, we look at special ed needs, we look at our alternative programs in that section. The next section, applicable policies, we look at the policies, that's pretty straightforward of how we organize our school buildings, how we transport students, and how we look at districting and redistricting when necessary. The enrollment and capacity section, enrollment projections, we typically look out 10 years to see what will be happening in the buildings. And we make sure that our plans concur with both the Maryland Department of Planning and with the local county government so that everybody's on the same page. The community analysis section, we work with our community partners here to analyze what's happening in Queen Anne's County as a whole. We anticipate that in, after the census is done in fiscal year 2020, we will probably see a much greater change to this section. Right now we're working on a lot of census numbers from 2010. So I would expect that in the next few years we're gonna see some larger changes in the community analysis section. Um, we look at the current demographic trends. We look at migration trends into the county and out of the county. We look at available infrastructure, such as new things happening like the Kent Island sewer line, building permits, new subdivisions, and um, any changes that have happened in our buildings over the past year. The facility inventory, Again, we're looking at our buildings and what the possibilities we will be for our needs in the upcoming years. And then the facility needs, this is probably the largest section and the one that changed, changes for us uh, the most every year. It looks at what our plans are gonna be for our facilities over the next seven to 10 years. It, um, right now we have Centerville Middle School as the main project that's on our radar, either a renovation project or a new building. So that is one that we've highlighted specifically in this year's plan. Um, in this year, one of the changes that we hadn't seen was the Centerville area schools are showing a greater utilization to potentially the elementary schools be able to utilize by 2028, and that's something we haven't seen before. So we're gonna be taking a closer look at that over the next year. Um, to see where that's trending. Annual dates and how they work together. Again, we have the Educational Facilities Master Plan. We come to you in June and July so that you can take a look at it, you can review it, and then we submit to the state. The Capital Improvement Plan, I'll be back to see you again in September to tell you what we anticipate our construction projects will be for the next fiscal year. We submit that, that to the state in October, and then the following February is typically when that goes to the county government for review. Capital funding for construction projects, both the county and the state are available funds. Funds are available to us beginning on July 1st every year. For planning and design, we only are allotted funds through the county. These are not eligible funds through the state, so it's the county funding only um, where we we begin those projects and that usually happens one to two years in advance of any construction that we're doing. So sometimes the planning of those projects will be three, four, five years before we're to the, the culmination of the project. The next steps uh, in your packets, there is a draft educational facility master plan for your review. We're hoping to have comments back by June 21st. That will give us a little bit of time to prepare the document so that we can send it to the state. On July 10th, we'll come to you for final questions, any modifications, and to ask for your approval. And then the next day, we will submit that to the state. I'll be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. So I see in here there's some uh I, I assume this is new data and it's in red? Correct. Anything, anything that was out, take, is there anything here that's been taken out? It was very difficult to track with all of the different entities and to have everyone do it in the same manner. So what we tried to do, anywhere the information changed, it was tracked in red so that you can see the changes. With all of the tables, any of the information on the schools, that changes yearly as well. Well, yeah, that's just updated information that's I see exactly. as of whatever the date is that it was submitted exactly. to you and put in this book. But uh, anything that was redlined and taken out, we wouldn't need to see that? Uh, not necessarily, no. It would, okay. it, 
mostly be. And for the most part, it isn't anything that has been taken out. Usually it's just changes. And for the most part, it's changes to those data numbers that we've well, gotten I, I get them. like Bayside and Graysonville, we added the wing. And, right. Yeah. Just, okay. I, I guess my question on that would be, if something we've looked at and gone with over a past year gets deleted, a lot of times it could be just be a line or strike through it. So we, well, you know, I mean, I, I don't remember everything I read. Sure, <laughs> and, understood. Uh, then it, it reminds you of what you're coming up with and what's gone out. Legitimate reason, probably changed. Nine out of ten probably are incidental, but there's probably be one or two once in a while where you need to know, yes, this is taken out. Well, then we can see, okay, was it replaced with something or just deleted? Agreed. And when looking at this and trying to put it together, it did. It was more prominent this year that we have many people working in many different programs and the way that they're uh, documenting everything isn't necessarily doing as good a job as we'd like to. So that's something that as we compile the information next year, we're going to see if we can either send them the program, require them to do it in a certain manner. We're right now we're using Google Docs, we're using PDF changes, we're utilizing Microsoft Word and they all change everything a little bit differently and it doesn't necessarily compile in the same format. So that's something that we want to work on next year too, to make sure we have a more cohesive idea and we have one working document instead of a bunch of different pieces. Because with a five year, seven year document, you know, it, it, it could change over each year a little bit sure. until something can be missing for good reason, but just slip through the cracks by some member that might have a certain reason to either want to hear about it or keep it in. Absolutely. So I see here the summary of changes. Yes, yeah, so provided in your online packet was a summary of changes and we tried to give you a listing of all of the items that we saw as comparing to the document last year, anything that was changed by any of our community partners. So that is something for your review as well. When we, when we do funding, I know it's wealth based. What are we, 60, 40, 50, 50? Now at this point we are 51% uh, state input, 49% county government. And that doesn't count a lot of, but when it gets right down to doing it, what is it? It differs depending on the project because there are soft cost things such as design fees, any type of permitting fees, testing, none of that is included or paid for by the state. So we're well under 50%. It's, it's a good bit under. So it could be 60, 40, 60 county, 40. Probably and I'm just picking. 60, 40. And there's That's also items project. that state won't reimburse you for that. Right. You, um, you know, there's length of life expectancy for those items. So right. sometimes they back out of those and, you know, you're kind of like holding the bag for that. So, then you, you know, it's just use an easy number to do. You say a $10 million project, the county thinks we're at, you know, 50, 50 or 55, 45, and all of a sudden the county's at 60, 65. And you know, that's, that's not, it's not our fault, no. but it's, we need to know that going in. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you Ms. Pollen. We're going to take about a five minute break. Okay, welcome back. Um, next item on agenda is the Food Services Management RFP. Yes. Good evening, board members. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kane. Um, tonight we're seeking uh, approval for the Food Service Management Company contract uh, between Queen Anne's County Public Schools and Sodexo um, for July 1st, 2019 and ending on June 30th, 2020 with an option for four one-year renewals by uh, mutual written agreement uh, with Sodexo. I also want to point out that um, the contract also has to be reviewed by MSDE and approved by MSDE. And we're also required every five years to put it out to bid. Um, I do want to point out that we had three companies, um, Sodexo's, Chartwell's, um, and Southwest Food Service attend our pre-bid meeting, um, and we received a no-bid letter from Chartwell's, and um, the one bid that we did receive was from Sodexo. So with that being said, I would like to point out the management fee for the new contract is 197000 <coughs> The guarantee is 143,000. Um, that is a decrease in the management fee where we used to be paying 228,000, and an increase in the guarantee um, from 103. So, this contract is basically self-generating based off the sales of 
um, breakfast, lunch. That guarantee that you see for us of 143,000, if um, if Sodexo does not meet that, they have to take that out of their management fee and pay us. So that money for the guarantee that is used to pay for our one maintenance uh, individual that does all the maintenance on all the kitchen equipment, refrigeration, and it's also used to purchase um, or repair equipment uh, in the kitchens. So. Any questions on that contract? I don't understand. With the management fee, we pay them. The management fee. Yes, the management fee is what we pay them for their employees and to run the, the operation. Okay, that's what they make. Period. They don't make above that. Um, it's not like a for-profit operation. That money goes to them to pay for their um, administrative fees, worker fees, and actually. All of the money that is collected each day during the school for sales, point of sales, each school has their own account. So we hold the money in the school system and then we pay Sodexo as it goes on. So it's not something where the money is going directly into uh, Sodexo's you know, account. It goes through us first and then we pay the um, management fee. But we guarantee the minimum we will pay them. You're saying is 143. The min the minimum guarantee. Back. No, Get the back. management fee that we will pay is 197, uh, one 197,121 dollars and 97 cents. The guarantee is what we get from Sodexo. All right. So that's the 143 sales. for point of sales, and we use that to fund the one maintenance position, and also for the equipment. We have to maintain the equipment and yes, sir. refrigerators and things. And yes, sir. That is correct. So once we approve this, then you you send it to MSDE for approval. Is yes. that how that works? Yep. Okay. And I will say, MSDE is and Miss Tony Shelf is here in case you have any question. Um, thank for her for 40 years of service helping us get through this. Um, but MSD is heavily involved in the contract and approving the different items and reviewing the RFP. Um, I think poor Tony's on the phone quite a bit with Bruce from MSDE, so um, just checking on things. For what purpose? For MSDE? Oh, yes, what, what, I mean, what are, they, what are they asking, Tony? Well, basically, the, the RFP is a USDA document. Come on, come on. Right. I mean, let's USDA document, right and that's, that's what we start with, and then we tweak it a little bit to meet our needs. And then we have to run it by MSDE so that they're okay with what we have in it and how it's worded. So they, we can't put it out there until they give us the go ahead. And are we still the only county in the state of Maryland that has an outsource? No, no the Talbot, others? Talbot County has been using a food service management company for two years now, I think. There's other, there's quite a few counties looking into right. doing it. Um, I wasn't in this position 15 years ago, but from what I understand, you know, we were operating in a severe red. Yes, it, um, I can remember the days when right, right. this has been a very, prop, not profitable, but reduced cost yes. to the right. thing right. and a more efficient way to do it. Mm -hmm. And forever, Queen Anne's County was the only one that outsourced it. Mm -hmm. Cafeteria. But they took all, they took, they had to, they took, we had the option to take our employees with them when it happened. So, you know, that was the big thing, but they, it worked. I thought worked out real well. If you look at the Mid-Atlantic region, Virginia, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, private companies that run it that's mm -hmm. not run by the school system. And we're not in the food service business. No. Like Dr. Sadowski. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, we would be approving um, this contract for this year with the option of four years. So every year we come back and have to reapprove it? No, you would or? approve it tonight. Mm -hmm. And then if we are content with each year after the performance, if we're fine with that, then upon mutual agreement, we would just keep that contract going okay. for so the renewals. So we're doing a five-year. So you're only allowed by state otherwise. to do five years. That's correct. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Anyone have any other questions? So I need a motion to approve the food service management company contract between Queen Anne's County Public Schools and Sodexo for July 1st, 2019, ending June, 20, June 30th, 2020,
with an option of up to four one-year renewals by mutual written agreement between us and Sodexo to the tune, um, the amount this year will be $197,000, $197,121.97. Coming from what part of the budget? Oh, yes. It comes out of, um, I'm sorry. Let me double check. The I don't have that. That's coming out of our current budget, our 2020 budget. Food service fund. It comes out of our, it does not come out of our, it comes out of our food service fund. Okay. Food service fund. Yes, okay. ma'am. Thank you. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. Motion and a second. This is right. All in favor? Yes. 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 That's five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Okay, it's approved. Thank you. Thank you. Next time, our textbook evaluation. Tony, thank you very much for your service. Yes, to this Tony. We're yeah, Tony. Miss you. <laughs> Five more years, you can come back and help out with us. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing this. Okay, textbook evaluation. Yep, uh, Madam President, the superintendent is seeking board approval for action item 8.03. Uh, this is the adoption of the following textbooks that have been out for a 30 day public review. We have had no comment uh, on those textbooks. Okay. And these textbooks are reviewed by staff and recommended by supervisors or whatever. And yeah, that's a great question, uh, Mr. Smith. All of our textbooks have to go through a review and evaluation process. So uh, there is a selection committee uh, that, has, that has, has to be selected. And then there are certain criteria uh, that have to be met uh, as part of our uh, materials of instruction uh, review policy. So they've all gone through that and then they become the recommendation uh, to the board. Then it's gotta go out for a 30 day public review uh, so that anybody in the public has a chance to review those items which are right behind me. Uh, and then we'll seek any public comment and come back uh, if there's any conflict or comment from the public. Good question. So I need a motion to approve the calculus, AP Calculus Part AB, AP Calculus Part BC, AP Biology, and AP Chemistry textbooks. So moved. Do I have it? Okay, a motion and second to approve those five textbooks. Yes. 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 Okay. Enjoy the textbooks. Thank you. Okay. Next item is um, uh, we need an approval on uh, uh, transfer between major state categories. Thank you, Captain Kelly, uh, board members. Uh, before you tonight is a request, as we've discussed over the last two months, uh, we've been running a deficit in the transportation category. We've done some end of the year projections. We've estimated what it will cost to run uh, all of the transportation and the bus costs through the end of the year. So before you tonight is a request to um, add $320,000 to the special ed, uh, I'm sorry, transportation category. Um, and it, it's related to um, special education student transportation, including extended school year, driver overtime, school vehicle attendance, driver substitutes, and field trip transportation costs for buses with lifts. Also included are increased homeless transportation needs, athletic transportation, and bus repairs. Where we will offset this money from is from our fixed charges category because we're anticipating um, lower than anticipated teacher and employee retirement costs, health insurance, and uh, fortunately <coughs> workers' compensation insurance has uh, allowed us to um, uh, alter our budget to move these funds to cover the deficit that is in um, the special ed category, as I mentioned, like you've seen for the last uh, two months. So we're requesting your approval for this transfer. Um, the letters before you, once approved or if approved, we will forward it on to the county commissioners. They'll have a hearing uh, sometime this month uh, and then approve that. And once that's made, uh, then we'll be back in balance with our um, expenditures for that particular category. Do we have any questions on that? Okay, I need a motion to approve. Can I, what, what was our total charge in this category? Because I haven't had a chance to go over the whole budget. In yes. transportation? Well, the, yeah, I mean, this is 320. Is this contractor buses or our buses? This is our buses and all the, really it's all related to special ed, which is what we, our drivers and our buses that we own. This is not related to the contracts. And we're 350 over, two, I'm sorry, 320 over that? Yes. 
put it in perspective, we had to add, when special needs students come, we had to create three different bus routes this year for three different programs to take. You know, we don't have any idea of when they're coming, you know, from a different school system. But also, I can tell you, um, 19 homeless students last year cost us an additional $78,000. We have to specially go pick them up separately? Yeah. If we can put them on a regular bus and transport them that way, we uh -huh. try to, but sometimes that's just not feasible. For instance, if you're living in Graysonville and we have to transport you back to your home school, which might be Churchill Elementary and Sullivanville Middle School, um, in the past two years, we've seen an increase of uh, 30 additional riders um, for students with special needs. The other, the other part that's not calculated into this is with the extended school year in the summertime, this past summer was the first time that we actually were transporting all of the students to about five or six different schools for that extended school year. Then you add on top of that, I'm talking about just with 15 buses we do all this, but on top of that, now you have unified sports so students with special needs are participating after school. So it's not all of them, but we still take the ones home after school, but then we have to come back and transport those students that um, are playing like unified bocce ball, uh, strength and conditioning and, and uh, tennis. I mean, so there's a lot of routes involved in this. Um, Margaret Ellen and I sat down and really went through, I mean, we came up with about 30 different pages and laid out the different maps to make sure that we weren't missing anything. And it's, I mean, it, it's tough to do. And then we have 11 businesses during the daytime that we transport um, students getting the, uh, the uh, job-related, work-related skills they need. We, we take them there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, special needs well, students, we also take base. them down to- um, Oh, like out of county too. Yeah, we also take them down to Bennington School, <coughs> the work service force down there um, outside of Easton. And then along with that, um, we're seeing an increase when we have field trips, um, students with disabilities, you know, having a, a bus transport to, you know, the Washington Zoo, um, the uh, Baltimore Zoo, Philadelphia, those kinds of things. And if you look at, I went back and kind of looked at it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the line item for special ed transportation has pretty much stayed stagnant for the past five years. There's been a fluctuation of $100,000 going up and down, but for five years it's, it's stayed stagnant. Um, the funding, yes. but the fee not, the cost not. No, it's no. gone up, 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 more up. and more and more and more. Right. Um, and we never know when they're coming. So if we have a student come in here and they go to the Maryland School for the Blind, we transport them. That's a new route, isn't it? That's correct. It's a new driver, it's a new vehicle, and it's a whole new student. And it's not somebody already somebody going. already going they can tag on but if it's a new school to us servicing the student in it's a whole new bill basically so well, I, I yeah i've been through that i just, I just hope i mean do, have we put the 320 in our new budget since we know we had to we're short on this so that's exactly and that's part of the issue so we are in the process of rectifying that line um, and how we got these dollars from fixed charges, I'm pretty sure that's what the letter says. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to rely on that. And we, we're going to add 320 to the next year's budget. But we, we got to re but we got to remember that those fixed charges will fluctuate depending upon the number of employees we have and how we pay those employees, whether it's out of a grant or whether it's out of our general funds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for right now, that is what we can do. Um, but as we move forward, that line is going to fluctuate. Did, did I explain that easily? Yes, and, and it's one of the things through the reconciliation process that we've looked at and will continue to look at. Um, but again, we could lose a homeless route and that saves us thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars So it is, it all, it's projected as the best that we can project, but every year there's going to be some anomalies. And as I can tell you, my predecessor and, and what I've seen for the last year, this is one of the areas, and the board members have been sitting there many years, this is the one of the areas that continually gets level funded, but has a large fluctuation in the amount of money that's required based on the needs of those particular year's students. So we will begin to address that but going we, forward in FY20. But our, this budget item here has been raised since we know this is 
a, a problem that hasn't been raised for five years. So last we, year, we, I think we might have transferred one hundred and seventy thousand um, yes. somewhere. So yeah. One hundred and seventy thousand. This year we're doing another transfer. Three, and this, and this year, year three, it's three hundred and twenty. So. You know, because we don't know how much more, but we do have to rectify that line. But we know it's more. Correct. I mean, it's, yes. There's a, there's a mm -hmm. pattern here. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe an off-the-wall question. Homeless. If the, uh, they're, they are citizens of Queen Anne's County. They're Correct. supposed to be going to our schools. Correct. Yes. Yeah, we're required by federal law, law That's why to we have to transport, transport yeah. them to their home school. Mm -hmm. um, as long as it's a reasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, they are residents of Queen Anne's County. Correct. So like somebody yes, might sir. go to Sellersville Middle School, mm -hmm. that's their home school, become homeless, and now maybe they live in Kent Island. Mm -hmm. We are required to go ahead and transfer them back to their home school. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there, it's not, it's not what I, I guess what I'm thinking is somebody there are coming students. from, the we not the West Shore, Delaware, anywhere, living right. with some relative, but it's really not a no. No. person. We check to These make sure that they're, and they're, they're a registered student within our enrollment. Okay. If you pull personnel workers go out there and investigate that yeah. to make sure that even if they end up living in another county, we'll transport them back here to their home school. That's our requirement. Correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. See any other ones there? Mr. Smith? Okay. Okay, any motion? Pardon? No, I was just saying it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> any motion to approve the transfer of $320,000 um, from fixed charges to transportation. So moved. Second. Okay, motion is second. Mrs. Wright. Board members, please respond once again when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Mossett? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the term of motion carried. Okay. Thank you very much. Next one is the transportation report. Yes. Um, I'm seeking approval. Sorry. Yeah, I'm HR. sorry. I'm sorry. A HR report. Sorry. I would Mr. ask Friday. the board, Captain Kelly, Duff Kane, <laughs> the board, to approve the um, human resources report as provided. Okay. Need a motion to approve the HR report okay. that was approved and uh, that was submitted in closed session. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Mrs. Wright. Once again, Captain Kelly. Yes. Ms. Harper. Yes. Ms. Harlow. Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Mr. Smith? Abstain. I have four of the affirmative and one abstain. Motion carried. Okay, HR report is approved. Now, transportation report. Yes, board members. Seeking approval for um, substitute bus driver, Ms. Uh, Darlene De Pompeo, who completed um, all of the requirements by uh, MSDE and also um, Queen Anne's County Public Schools. I'm also seeking. Um, approval of uh, three new bus purchases. Um, William, um, Billy Willis, his bus has met the 15 year requirement and will be going out of service, um, seeking to replace that bus. And Mr. Lamont Wright's bus is at 13 years um, and is having quite a few mechanical problems and repairs with that bus. Um, one of the items, just on a side note, we've realized since we've gone from the 12 to the 15 year, we have really noticed a lot of repairs, even with our own buses, just within that three year time span. Um, and when those buses are up north with more miles, of course, there's more wear and tear. And then the last one would be for uh, Mr. Lawrence Chenault, who would like to purchase a bus as a unpaid spare. There is no PVA associated with this. Um, he purchases the bus. And basically, if other buses break down, people can use that or you can use it for a field trip. There will be new PVAs associated with um, Mr. Willis and Mr. Wright um, because, again, that time frame, uh, you know, has gone by. That will be an additional $14,000. Um, you know, if you go back to the 15-year PVA, of course, it's increased about six to 7000 Mr. Pender, why do we have to approve for him to have an unpaid spare? Because it will go on May Bar Insurance, that part of it. I mean, there's a small fee that we're associated with it. It will have our radio on there, and it will have our um, camera system on there. So is it absolutely necessary for him to have this bus at this time? There's nothing to say we can't. I mean, because we're not. I'm just, I'm just asking. I'm just no. putting it out there. No. 
I mean, because if it's just sitting in a lot, we're not going to be using it anytime soon. I, I, why are we? We'll say this: we've even we try to keep a certain amount of spares on our fleet. That when other buses break down, we're having a hard time keeping up with that for the simple fact of we cannot. Um, with all the tr children we're transporting, <coughs> homeless, and all that, we're, we're just pulling spares from everywhere. Um, so there's a not. There's not as many as there used to be. There used to be quite a few. Okay. Thank you. With, with PVA, what's it? Five, you said seven thousand a year. It would be an increase uh, on PVA for uh, Mr. Willis's bus of six thousand eight hundred forty-eight. The PVA for um, I'm sorry, correction. The for Mr. Wright's bus would be um, an increase of six thousand eight hundred forty-eight dollars, and for um, Mr. Willis would be $7,848. And, so and, and Mr. Chenault, we're not paying that. Not, not paying but we, we will have a one-time cost of the camera or whatever in there, but it will be used sometimes for our school system. Yes. And when it is used then, at, he tracks that so we do p play PVA for no. the, no, never. No. As long as it's an unpaid spare, okay. we do not pay anything for it. Okay. And it becomes paid when he brings it on. He decides to like have one of his other buses go out after they've got 13, 14, 15 years. Oh, okay. Years. Yes, then the PVA starts. Then the PVA, but the PVA will come on at that high rate. At, you know, the new rate you know, later on. Yeah. So, hey, but he would have to sign it to a route or something on our yes, system. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay, and I need a motion to approve the transportation report. Um, for a substitute bus driver, Darlene De Pompeo, and for three buses to be purchased for Mr. Shanad, Mr. Willis, and Mr. Wright. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Board number three, Ms. Barn, what's your name? Call it Captain Kelly. Yes. Ms. Harper. Yes. Ms. Harlow. Yes. Ms. Mossad. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Five in your service, Mr. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next is a Queen is County High School, Future Farmers of America to University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Mr. Sure. Uh, Madam President, uh, Superintendent seeks uh, action item 8.07, field trip, Queen's County High School, Future Farmers uh, of America. This is for 15 students. Uh, annually, they travel to the Maryland State FFA Conference. Um, just seeking a, your, the board's approval. Um, this is, would be an overnight field trip. Okay, and you may as well tell us about the other one too. Sure, sure. Likewise, this is a this is an annual trip as well. This is um, also Queen Anne's County High School uh, for seven students to travel to St. Mary's College. This is the annual environmental thon competition, um, and just seeking your approval. That's also an overnight field trip. Okay. Does anyone have any questions on these field trips? I'm, I'm just looking at who's paying for. It's all coming out of student funds. I mean, students are paying for this. Fundraising. One, one uh, with it, fundraising. I think one was a grant, too, wasn't it? The environmental one? Anyhow, I think one was a grant. Uh, the environmental, the fundraising. Fundraising both? Yeah, okay. yeah. Sorry. I see it now. Thank you. I'm looking at the FFA one. Is that the overnight one? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. To both the of them are. Of June. Mm -hmm. I, I see there, and this is just a question I have, and I don't know the real policy. There's 15 yeah. students going. And only one chaperone? Sure. So our policy uh, for high schools um, is uh, 1 to 10. And for our elementary and our middle schools, it'll be 1 to 15. And so it still meets the requirement. Chaperones. Still needs two. Still. Wait, the other way around, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I had it backwards. To okay. 1 to 15, to 1, to, 1 to 10. So you're allowed one chaperone for 15 students. And, it's, and you have both male and female students and only one chaperone. Well, that's but what teachers go to, right? Correct. Advisors. And they don't get categorized as chaperones, but they basically do the okay. job of it. Oh, the, okay. So there's more. So more there's, adults than one. It's just not one adult taking 15 yeah, kids yeah. somewhere. Yeah. 15 high school kids. No, I'm just, no that's a good question because no, it kind of was the opposite question last month when we approved right. a field trip for the invite so for Mad Peak. There were so many adults going, and so few children, but they all had a reason and a job duty. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the only, the only thing is the grant, with so. one, yeah, it that's just a scares great me because something, if you have one-on-one, -on -one, you still, if something goes wrong, yeah. you right. got a problem. Yeah. No, you're right. I, yep. I wasn't making fun of us. It's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. 
Walter. Okay, and a motion to approve two field trips, one for FFA um, going to a convention at U UMES on June 23rd to 26th. And the other one is a Queen's County High School Environmental Club to St. Mary's College in St. Mary's, Maryland, um, June 19th to June 20th. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Mr. Wright. Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, uh, College Board. Yeah, Th this is new. Um, not exactly, but. Well, it's, a, a, and then we're getting to this component where ensuring that any contract that's over 25,000 is coming to the Board of Education. So uh, what is new as part of this contract in the last year in the board, part of the, the superintendent's recommendation is to provide for the school day SAT. Um, and that is in this contract as well. So what this contract includes is the PSAT, uh, which we administer in October of every year uh, to all of our 10th graders. And this also includes uh, the school day SAT, which this year we administered for the very first time and I'm uh, to all of our juniors and any senior that did not take uh, at that point the SAT uh, in their senior year. Uh, and I believe I'd go back and, and take a couple look at some board reports, but we had an astounding 97% uh, participation rate. Um, this is a tremendous service that we're providing to our communities, uh, to our parents that we're providing the SAT. Don't forget that the SAT is also a uh, college and career readiness indicator. So we're really kind of um, duly serving um, two points here by providing it uh, the one-time administration for free and also the college and career readiness uh, aspect as well. Well, my question was when we did the SAT this year, and I thought it was like 14000 the SAT al alone. We, we budgeted for that because that was a new initiative. Correct. So aren't we, com we, we, we did, I think we did 15,000 was our request in the, um, um, in the budget last year. I think it was around for there. And that was just for the SAT. Right, right, right. Okay. right. But I know we've been doing the PSATs. We've been paying for that too. Yeah. So this is one organization doing all of that? That's is correct. That why it's 30? That's correct. So and it's taking place in school. It is. As During as school year. First time. It was this year. This year was the first time oh, we've yeah, ever done yeah. it. I'm reminding everybody. And had a great How participation. How important that is. <laughs> no, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just trying to figure out sure. what the difference in price is. Sure. And it's like PSAT double. and SAT. And SAT, every student gets to take it one time. Yeah. Uh, for our current juniors, and we just administered that this year, Mr. Smith, for the very first time that we did it during the day. Normally, um, our schools are testing sites, mm -hmm. so normally they'd have to take it on a Saturday. Right. Or if we're not administering, they might go to Easton High School or neighboring high school to take it. Um, this allows us to capture uh, all of our juniors during the school day, um, get them in, get them you know, the opportunity to take it, and we've had 97% um, across the board, so that's about 500 and 55, 60 students at both high schools participating. That's tremendous. Now, but, it, but if they want to take it on their own as a sophomore or later on, some other time, they can do what they want. That's uh, uh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. They're free to take it any time that they want. Uh, we're just providing this uh, service uh, to them during the day. Now, I don't know what the privacy laws is, but I don't care what who the student is. Do we get... Do we get a, like a number to see what our students are doing? Oh, absolutely. Oh, we have okay. a, the the you, the reporting aspect of this is is us tremendous. Back to us, so we can. It's, I mean, so it helps us track how we're doing in our system. It, it, it does. There's so many different reports, and that's that's another piece of this. There's a whole suite. There's a suite for the student. There's a suite for the parent, so they can really understand. And so, in the PSAT, that we'll use that information, for an example, and I'll connect it to the superintendent's initiative on equity with our equal opportunity schools. So it allows us to be able to see if students have potential to go into an advanced placement course. We'll use this information to say, you know, and look at, well, you know, equal access, and, and this student has potential to be in an upper level course. Why aren't they? Mm -hmm. and, and they need to be scheduled on that. We also use it from a curriculum design standpoint. So we use this information in mathematics. We also use it in uh, English language arts to improve our curriculum 
in areas where we're seeing across the district, maybe there's some deficiencies or weaknesses, we can build that up within our curriculum to support our teachers with those skills. So do we charge the students to take their, a their SATs? I know there is a, a fee associated with it for the students to take an SAT, correct? Yes, okay. absolutely. So is there that is paid directly to College Board? Yes. Okay, yes. so we don't get any of, we don't see any of those funds. So we, you know, students would register just like they normally would, and then, yeah, there's no cost that, there's no money that I actually change hands. To, with us. With them. Or with them. We with pay for their one time. We're test. paying for their one time. One time, time they get one time. Correct. Right. As long as it's on our property. So it says on here, and I'm reading the, I'm reading the um, contract, and I, I may not make any big difference, but you're the client as, at, you're the acting client for our school system on behalf of the superintendent yeah. okay okay that, I just want to make sure that that's that's legal mm -hmm. okay yep. okay I, if I remember correctly if the student should take it on their own and pay the school still gets a copy of their scores yes uh, uh, absolutely they'll they'll register because they have to register at a their our high school mm -hmm. then that high school would get all that data and that information as well okay. what is the and I want to know about the college preparation that part of their contract, I, I confess I didn't read through the whole contract, but no, college part of it talks about um, exposing high school students to a wealth of college preparation and planning. Do they provide that? They do. So there's some, some resources that are attached to that, like the Khan Academy, uh, as an example, um, which is part <coughs> of a resource through the College Board. Um, there's also some planning elements that, that uh, with each of our school counseling departments that they utilize. Um, the big thing here is to be able to help students understand what the information is and to be able to unpack and how do they use the information to plan um, for not only their next course sequence uh, but beyond that as well and there, there's a whole parent piece to this as well which I think is, is extremely important. Uh, we certainly can always do more work of you know exposing parents to this kind of information as well. The college board provides that? Yeah, they, they provide a, a lot of resources and tools um, that are virtual. They provide virtual. that to you and you disseminate it to the mm -hmm. high school? So there's a, an, each individual has a student account, and within that student account there is a host of resources um, that the child has access to, as well as their parents. So by us purchasing this, it provides all that access to the individual student and their parent. Oh, okay. So this is put into their account. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that they have this set amount when they have no idea how many students are going to have to take it. You know? So this doesn't, this doesn't, there's no quantitative amount of, I mean, we can have an X number, doesn't matter how many students we have doing this, this is going to cover all of them. For both Ken, Ken Allen and Queen Anne's County, Queen Anne's County High School. It covers all of our, all of no our. No matter, because well, we have no idea how many are going to take it. Well, not necessarily. So we have an enrollment for each grade level. So we have a range, and that they'll work from a range. So I'm going to make a number up. So say we have between 400 and 500 students, or 400 and 450 students that will that are enrolled in the grade that we've decided, 11th grade or 10th grade or whatever it is, to take the test. So we are they're basing it on the enrollment uh, number. Okay. And the number of students. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? So I need a motion to approve the contract with the college board for a contract period July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020 in the amount of $30,395, which will be coming out of the FY 2020 operating budget. So moved. <coughs> motion and a second. Well, then, Ms. I call your name. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of the affirmative for Mr. Perry. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Pender. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Paul, could you please come up for the Bayside generator? Good evening once again. Carla Pullen, the facilities planner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Uh, we're requesting contract approval tonight for the replacement of the Ken Island High School fire alarm. This is a 21-year-old fire alarm system. The project, if you recall, was publicly bid in March. We uh, brought 
that award to this body at the April meeting and we did not have any qualifying bids and it was decided not to an award not to award uh, a contract <coughs> at that time after that we reached out to several cooperative purchasing uh, entities to try and secure funding or try to secure a contract that would be <coughs> in our available amount of funding and we were able to successfully do so with Johnson Controls Simplex so I have uh, included a revised tabulation. We're recommending to remain within the project budget to accept the base bid price for replacing the system in the amount of $635,975. We are also recommending accepting alternate number two that adds exterior notification appliances. So there will be outside speakers and strobes. So anyone outside of the building will also be notified that there's an alarm going off inside. That's in the amount of $7,650. Alternate number three adds generator monitoring to that system in the amount of $12,342. And acceptance of alternate four, which is the inclusion of speaker strobe notification throughout the building, including classrooms, as opposed to just the uh, strobe. So the overall total contract amount would be $681,782. I see the capital budget 663. Correct. And to uh, accommodate alternate number four, there was some funding that we were able to secure out of one of the uh, capital lines from fiscal year 2019, since we do believe that this is an important inclusion for a system that will probably be in place at least 20 years in that building. One of the things we realized from doing our safety evaluations <clears throat> was having students that uh, might be visually impaired Okay, you can hear the alarm going off, but with the new system now, it actually tells you, you know, what is occurring and what's what's happening. So some of these alternates that we would want to do have come up from different schools, uh, you know, through practice and, and learning of what's occurring at each each location to try to accommodate that. As well as those that are that cannot hear, they have the visual of seeing in the classroom the lights going off, and they know that there's an emergency. So we only got one bid, or didn't get that? We did. We initially bid this in March. We received two bids. Oh, we did speak to. Yes. They were hugely far apart. One was a non-acceptable manufacturer per the RFP, and the other one was almost double the amount of our budget. So we decided at that time that it would be a no award, and this body rejected the bids at that time. There wasn't anything that was sustainable out and, of that. And, and this bid that's come in, Johnson, who have we uh, used to find out this is a reasonable amount of money for this? Well, this is a cooperative purchasing bid, so it is a bid that has already publicly been bid. Okay. And then we tap into, we're a member of the source well agreement, and so we are just able to utilize that bid. With another school system or another industrial building? It's a national contract. You know, Queen Anne's County government uses source well quite a bit also when they do their okay. contracts. All How many bid. schools has Johnson Controls been in? Our schools? Oh, our schools. All, all four, all 14 of them. I think they do the No, we, we, 10, for EMS controls, it's 10 out of 14. At Johnson and Controls? Then, yeah, it's and now they've acquired Simplex Grinnell, which um, we have predominantly in all of our schools. Most of our fire alarm systems. Okay. We're large number of them right are Simplex. We're buying parts right now off of eBay, you know, to keep the one at Calhoun High School running. Johnson Controls is used in many, many school districts in the state. And this is comparable at our safety at all our schools. I mean, we're doing Ken Island this year, but they're all. Yes, we just did Graysonville Elementary School last year. Um, you know, we're doing again this year um, Ken Island. But we have been able to secure funding to do some other ones like Kennard Elementary School. We, we realized that their school didn't have any outside speakers. So when something was going on, a fire alarm all of a sudden here comes all the kids out of the building um, the kids were at recess had no clue of what was occurring and it, it creates a little bit of a hysteria um, so we that school we've done Sellersville Elementary so we're you know one at a time picking them so up. we're getting parity pretty much Sorry. I mean no, nobody's no way no, out going no. no no and it's in our fiscal year budget for the upcoming year to do the replacement at Churchill Elementary School and this is capital Correct. And this has been approved by the, I mean, 
they put it into thing. Yes. Okay, I need a motion to approve the contract between Queen Anne's County Public Schools and Johnson Controls uh, Simplex to replace the fire alarm system at Ken Island High utilizing the source well cooperative purchasing contract. Um, we will be doing the basic contract alternative two, alternative three, and alternative four for the total cost of $681,782 with part coming out of FY18 capital and part coming out of FY19 capital. So move. Second. We have a motion and second to approve this contract. Mrs. Wright. Board members, please respond once you need to call it. Captain Kelly? Yes. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bayside yep. Elementary. Oh, I'm going to do that with you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Bayside Elementary. So, again, a contract approval for the Bayside Elementary School generator replacement. This is also utilizing a cooperative purchasing contract. I'm sorry. Carl, we're looking at the, I'm sorry, Bayside. The digital IP oh, I'm security sorry. cameras. Right. Sorry, we, we jumped Bayside ahead to the generator. Centerville. <laughs> but you can stay. I think we're going to go one by one if you want to okay. hang so out there. So the next four, um, we were able to secure about three hundred fifty thousand dollars from the Maryland um, Safe School Act, and then also um, included in that was a grant we also wrote for Mabe. So between the two grants, uh, three hundred fifty thousand, you will see um, some capital in here. Of, the tune of 44,318. The first um, approval I need is for us to install um, interior cameras at all of our elementary schools. Um, that's basically phase two. If you go to all of our middle and high schools, they have interior and exterior cameras. Currently, right now, the elementary schools have exterior cameras and then cameras at the entrances. That's it. So we are looking to install um, cameras in the interior, gymnasium, cafeteria hallways. Um, and we will, are piggybacking on the Carroll County Public Network contract, which we have used to do all of our other um, security camera work and also our access controls. If you, the listing there of all the schools, and then if you look at the second uh, page, um, it, for $202,880.54, <coughs> And 90,000 of that will come from the Maryland School Safety Grant Program. 86,562 will come from MAVE Risk Control uh, Grant. And then the remaining 44,318 will come from um, our FY19 capital um, funding. This also includes two exterior digital IP security cameras yes. and anchor points. Yep. Okay. And the schools are listed there. I mean, if you want to read off them. But. Okay. Am I missing something? Because the total's different, like twenty thousand different. No, look at uh, I want sitting here right now. The um, the Maryland Risk Control Award. It should be sixty-eight. Okay, I, that's, a that's it. Then. I Thank you. Uh, good catch, Sharon. Sixty-eight five sixty-two. Yes. Okay. Now it totals closer to right, two or two. And, and these cameras are monitored by personnel at, at the school. Yes, so about four years ago, five years ago, we had about 40 cameras that were all different systems. We had five different systems. With the camera system we have now, they're all IP digital. Um, every principal, every um, administrative assistant has it on their laptop. They can view them from anywhere. Um, this summer, we will be tying in with NView, which is like when you look at the Bay Bridge cameras and the highway cameras, it's the same concept so that when something occurs, law enforcement will be able to view them when something is happening. I believe will be probably the third school system in the state to have that. Um, now granted, anybody won't just be able to pick it up and look at it like you Understand. can. But law enforcement, yeah. yeah. So, I didn't want to ask the question too deep. No, but in case something unfortunately happened, it would also help us in yep. assessing the situation. That's correct. By proper sources, not public, but not by profit sources. And you'll see the next couple of pieces, you'll see how it all kind of ties in together, but um, it's a good vehicle to have. Gotcha. Okay, and I don't want to be the bad guy here, but can we get a corrected copy yes. to vote on before we vote? Mm -hmm. I don't want to vote for this with the error in it. 
Okay. Captain Kelly, make I'm gonna read yeah, I'm gonna read the back yeah. back. I'll read the correction mm -hmm. on it when we take the motion. Okay. And I apologize for that. I well, I mean, it's an honest mistake, but well, she's gonna you guys it. are approving this document. But she's going to read the right. I'm going to read what we're approving, and then they'll it's just it. a document that's attached to this agenda. Until I see a document with the correct information, we've had this issue come up before. I won't vote on something that's incorrect information on a piece of paper that we're approving. Captain Kelly, Sorry. can you make an amendment on that to make sure that that's done to the one you're going to sign yeah. that's done correctly for Sharon? Okay. I just changed it on here. This is the one I'm signing that's approved after we take our vote. And we, we'll read it that way. Right. So I need a motion to approve the purchase and installation of interior digital IP security cameras at Bayside Elementary, Centerville Elementary, Graysonville Elementary, Kennard Elementary, Kent Island Elementary, Mattapique Elementary, Sellersville Elementary, and also two exterior digital IP security cameras at Anchor Points Academy. Um, this, um, these cameras will be purchased uh, off the Carroll County Public Network contract in the amount of $202,880.54 with, with uh, 90,000 coming out of the school safety grant program for FY19 68,562 coming out of MABE risk control reward and FY19's capital security to the tune of $44,318.54. So moved. Second. So how do we get that document attached to this agenda? We'll, we'll correct it. I'll correct it. Okay. Okay, the motion in a second, Mrs. Wright. Board members, please respond. What's your name? Please call Captain Kelly. Yes. Mrs. Harbor. Yes. Mrs. Harlow. Abstain. Mrs. Um, what's that? Yes. Mrs. Smith. Yes. I have four affirmative and one abstain. Motion carries. Okay. Um, the next item seeking approval for is we would like to purchase 300 uh, emergency preparedness medical kits from Chinook Medical Gear. If you remember. These were all of the tourniquet kits that we installed in the classrooms. Um, it was a very uh, overwhelming response um, from teachers and staff of, hey, we don't have one in the cafeteria, we don't have one in the resource room. So what we did was we put them all in the classrooms. This um, funding will come from the Maryland Safe School Act. And I'm seeking approval based off of the General Service Administration schedule um, this is how we purchased the ones last time, and also it is how DES, um, Queen Anne's County DES, coordinates with this group. So everything is um, the same at every school, and when you pull up, the ambulance has the same equipment on there, so they're familiar with all of this. So seeking approval for um, this contract for $26,304, funded by the Safe School Fund, um, to purchase the medical kits. Okay. Anyone have any questions on this purchase? So I need a motion to approve the purchase of 300 emergency preparedness medical kits from Chinook Medical Gear Incorporated uh, using the GSA contract. Uh, the amount of it, of it is $20,304 and it will be, I'm sorry, $26,304. It will come out of the Maryland uh, State Department of Education Safe School Fund for FY19. So moved. Second. Board members, please respond with your name is called. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mrs. Wissett? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. I have five in the firm with Thank you. Okay, Motion is carried. Motion carried. The next item um, is for us to uh, purchase and set up the uh, emergency response information portal and site mapping of all facilities. Currently, right now, all of our emergency plans, they're on a thumb drive. Um, it is not on a digital platform that can be shared anywhere. Um, basically, with the pictures associated with it, I would walk around to every school and take pictures and put it into this. With the company that we're looking to go for, they're the um, only company that's certified by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. 
We have about four or five other public school systems in the state that are using this company. And what this will involve is um, they will take our plans and put them on a digital format. Um, and then we'll also have the security assessment, all the drills, it's all on one um, software device. And the other part that's very important in this piece is, last year we had to get all the teachers, custodians, staff through training of stop the bleeding and active uh, assailant response. This will enable us to go to e-learning so that we're not having to pull everybody and spend all of that time. Um, so it's more efficient. We can track who's taking the courses, who has not taken it. And then, like I said, the, the other great part about this is the, um, the, the site mapping. So law enforcement will have all of that, where the cameras are located, the hallways. When you click on there, there's a 360 degree picture of each classroom. So if there's something happening somewhere, you click on that, they're aware of what the area looks like gymnasium, those types of things. Um, this will be funded by the Maryland Safe School Act um, grant for $55,250. Um, any questions on this one? You give that out to certain people that are qualified to have that information to get That's access. Correct, sir. Does that change every so often in this contract? So, you know, as six months or a year goes by, administration change, different things change, you can reset it so everybody's got to get recoded? Yes, yeah, so what now? What I do now is I have basically the information we have is so large, it's on a thumb drive, and I'm going around literally <coughs> to the Sheriff's Department, hey, here's an updated one. Oops, principal switched school. Hey, here's another up updated one. This would all be on a digital platform that we can allow access to. Um, the, and the other good part about this is if there were to be a crisis, the teachers can pull up on their cell phone or the administrator the actual plan of how they want to respond to it. They're not going to get into like the personal data, but they'll actually be able to go, okay, you know, it's a bomb threat. Here's our procedure, one, two, three, four. I mean, standard operation. Right now, what they got to do, they got to go find the manual, the book, and the paper, and that's not going to happen. Um, but the confidential information and all that stuff, yes, it will be, you know, select criteria of what law enforcement can see the general public won't okay, right yep yes sir and the newspaper yeah yes sir that's correct so you're saying here though that cecil county has it kent county has it all yep. these counties have it yep. already yep okay. and like i said it's the only one that's sponsored by the u.s department of homeland security um there's okay. other companies out there that offer when you start getting in this specialized area you're, you're kind of limiting yourself um, of what you can have and you can't have. So, but all of those needs come from that one company. And those two counties have been very happy with it. Okay, and the name of that company is what? Um, safe, safe Plans. Safe Plans, okay. Yes, ma'am. I need a motion to approve purchase of emergency response information portal um, provided by Safe Plan, which is a sole source contract for this, um, but many schools are using it now. <coughs> Cost is $55,250 and is being funded by the Maryland State Department of Education Safe School Fund for FY19. So moved. Second. The motion is second on this purchase. Mrs. Wait, Wright. Please respond once your name is called. Captain Kelly? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Marlowe? Yes. 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 Mr. Yes. I have five in the affirmative motion carried. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the last item um, again deals with the Maryland Safe Center School Act. Um, and we're seeking approval um, in the amount of $92,395 from Alertus Technology. And if you heard me earlier talk about people that are visually impaired or um, have some hearing issues, <coughs> what we've realized in doing our assessments. Um, is we don't really have anything in areas of, uh, say, the cafeteria. They're never going to hear the speakers. The gymnasium, they're never going to hear the speakers go off. Um, what this will allow us to do is put the um, devices in cafeterias, band rooms, chorus rooms, uh, auditorium, so that if there is an emergency, that those beacons will be activated, along with there's an LED screen. So 
people can look up and actually go, hey, you know, it's a bomb threat going on or this is a lockdown situation. The other package that comes along with this is that we will have at least two panic buttons at every school similar to a, like a bank. One will be in the front office, one will be in the principal's office, um, so that when you activate that, it will automatically send it out to law enforcement. Probably the, the greatest piece in this is when we go into lockdown, it's really not going to be feasible for everybody to be communicating on the intercom system. I mean, because people could be running out the building, in the building. This program here allows you the principal or a designee to overtake the computer screen of every computer in the school so that they can send information to them on that computer screen just as another step you know into communicating what to do you know or exchange information the other part and as we've had we've had some tornado warnings here recently this automatically kicks in when there is a tornado warning or tornado watch so it's no longer me calling up or emailing going hey uh, you know something's coming boom 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 it automatically kicks into that um, so there's some important features on there that we're, we're trying to improve the communication piece because somebody asked me about cell phones. When something goes down, those cell phone towers are going to be so jammed, you're not going to be able to use them. Um, and this is a, a pretty good device. It was, If you remember the uh, incident they had at the University of Maryland, they have the same similar equipment there, and several other counties have gone for this. Um, so I'm recommending approval uh, for the Alertus technology. Um, again, it's grant funded in the amount of $92,395. What's the LED uh, marquee? The LED in, marquee will be the, the scroll. Going like, over the computer? Uh, no. It will be like if you go into the cafeteria, oh, uh -huh. you'll see the beacon flashing, right. but then you'll be actually able to see, hey, you know, bomb threat or lockdown or shelter in place. So these are going to go in each different location throughout each school? Yeah, so okay. yeah, cafeteri cafeterias, um, gymnasium, band room, um, course room and auditorium of every school. Yes, sir. Yep. We try to keep it consistent. Okay. A motion to approve the purchase of um, alert beacons, notification system, panic buttons, LED marquees, and Al Alteris and ENS solution suite um, provided by Alertus Technology. Sorry, I should have said that originally. Um, and in the cost of $92,395, and that is funded by the Maryland State Department of Education Safe School Funding for FY19. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Mrs. Rose. Yes. 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 Ms. Poulin, you're on again. Thank you. Now a generator. Now we'll <laughs> talk about the Bayside generator. <laughs> so this is a request for contract approval for the Bayside Elementary School generator replacement. Um, this is, uh, we're going to replace the unit so that it's a larger, a slightly larger capacity. We'll also be adding the walk-in cooler and freezer at that school, which is not currently on the generator. Uh, we're utilizing the U.S. Communities Cooperative Purchasing Contract for this contract as well. We were able to see with a project earlier this year, one of our chillers, uh, to do a side-to-side -side comparison between a, uh, the use of U.S. Communities and an actual bid project, and we saved about 20% by utilizing U.S. Communities, so we're recommending that we do that here as well. The total budget amount, or I'm sorry, the total uh, dollar amount is $279,740.56 with Boland. Um, and my question is, uh, this is from the FY18 capital budget. How long can we carry money over? Um, it's it's a two-year time period. Two years. So, yep. I'm telling you, you get the design documents and all the engineering documents, a, a year passes and then the actual installation occurs. So this is 279,000 and change and the budget you said is 347. Correct. So we're just under budget. We're under budget. There was also initially several years ago, MEMA, the Maryland Emergency Unit, was requiring that any type of new electrical upgrades, any generator upgrades, 
they wanted to have a say in how much of the school you actually powered in hopes that they'd be able to use it as an emergency shelter at some point. Our argument with Bayside Elementary School is that it's not in an area that would be conducive for use as a shelter. Um, and it was almost three quarters of the school that initially they wanted us to power, including air conditioning. Um, since then, those regulations have uh, eased a little bit and public school construction is now saying, no, we don't believe that that would be utilized as an emergency shelter. And so therefore our budget number had been higher to accommodate for that, but we are, so we're coming in significantly lower at this point. Okay. Do any of our schools set up for emergency shelters mm -hmm. down on Canal Island? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's only one emergency shelter in the county at Centerville Middle School. No. I mean, just at some point talking to the county, and, you know, they would have to pay some of or all of it. <laughs> yeah. Do they, do they, I mean, what do you do when, you know, we have a massive snowstorm or lose electric? Canal Island can lose it pretty easily. Uh, would it be smart? They open some, Centerville, but it's a long way to go in a snowstorm. I'm talking about it any is. reasons it Canal is. might not They had Canal in High School open for in the past. We have. They, yeah. they, yeah. they, they have in the past, but right. since not, then the the meetings that I attend with Dr. Ciatola and all, they want to concentrate just on Centerville Middle School. Um, you know, that's kind of their call. Okay. Yeah, um, it is. You know, and, and I get some of the reasoning. I mean, it, it's adjacent to 301. You know, it's not too far off the main drag. Um, the only issues that come up with the schools on Kent Island, even Graceville, is, is just flooding. Um, you know, in a hurricane type of situation. But we have op opened them up in the past, and they just have kind of decided. I can't think of what that team's called, but decide they want to focus on Centerville Middle School. That's fine as long as they're. But I'm just wondering when we upgrade something. Look, we're up not this school, but if we're upgrading the high school or Mattapique or something, mm -hmm. saying. You know, it's going to cost us 200 If you want to do it for 500 and have a place for forward think, that's up to them. But, I mean, uh, it would be something to, opportunity to do it. The regulations that MEMA had put in place were just... Oh, I'm sure it's catastrophic. It might not be, it might be, you know. But, I mean, how do you get off Canala? Nope. I mean... Uh, I understand. I mean, it's not, that's an emergency service problem, not ours, but... Okay. Okay, any motion to approve... The, the contract for the Bayside Elementary School generator replacement for, um, I'm sorry, I missed who was giving that 347. to 347. Bolin. Bolin, I'm sorry. Bolin. Um, and it's for the amount of $279,740.56 funded by the FY 2018 capital budget. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Mrs. Wright. Well, this, again, this Kathleen Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of the affirmative motion carried. Thank you. Okay. Do we need our technology people? Are you presenting this? Yeah, Mr. Fister and I um, are going to tag okay. team. I'm gonna, yeah, we're going to tag team. I'm going to put my technology hat on. Uh, Kevin Kelly, do you want to review these individually? You want me to go sort of summary of all of them? Um, Wonderful. And then attach them or... Explain well, each one individually. individually. Okay, we'll do. Mm -hmm. The first one, the inter internet content filtering, um, it's a request for a uh, purchase of $105,000, three years at $35,000 a year. Basically, this protects all of our computers, our student laptops and everything from receiving spam, viruses, and things like that. It's something we've had in place. This is a, a contract renewal, something for the safety, um, you know, again, of our, our systems. And, and Any all. questions on this? Yeah. How how can we possibly we had 2020 to 2022 operating budget so we're i'm paying i'm sorry go ahead we're expecting to have that in the budget we currently have thirty five thousand dollars in the budget and we're we're procuring a three-year contract in which we will spend thirty five thousand dollars per year but to get the pricing we have to agree for to do this over the next three years it's 35 each yeah i get but, that but i get i get it I just if uh, we don't have this then our devices have no virus protection or no, 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 okay no, I'm just devil's advocate they don't fund our fully uh, fund our capital budget you know this is then I would assume we would make sacrifices elsewhere yeah we gotta we gotta this figure is, out because yeah, we need to have okay. I'm just being yeah, just put it out there non-negotiable this is okay okay good so I need a um, motion for contract approval of the internet content filtering um, contract for light speed systems to $105,000 over three years. 
Um, that's it. Budgeting source. Oh, budgeting source, I'm sorry, is the operating budget for 2020 to 2022, those three years. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. This is right. Board members, please respond. What's your name is called? Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in your affirmative. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, motion carries. Microsoft licensing. So this is to pay for all of the Microsoft Office access that we have uh, on all of our devices, and and including our servers that we use to you know to run you know our student information system, um, all the backbone necessary to to run our systems. Um, this is again purchasing through Meek, the Maryland Educational um, Educational, I'm sorry, Maryland Education Enterprise Consortium, which probably every school district in Maryland purchases through here. Again, like we've talked about ad infinitum tonight about taking advantage of cooperative purchase agreements. This is how we're funding this one. Uh, again, an annual, you'll see this every year. It's an annual uh, upgrade. Uh, prices fluctuate very modestly uh, going forward. So tonight is a request uh, for the next year's purchase, uh, $57,194.18. And this is currently budgeted in the FY20 operating budget as it is in the 19 budget, as it was in the 18 budget. Any questions? Well, we haven't even approved our budget yet. Why are we approving this? I'm just asking a question. Um, okay. Well, we're, we're putting it forward because we need to get it done because our first board meeting in July is after, is July 10th. Okay. And so we needed to get this done so we didn't want to if, be if, if, I, if I could add to that, um, Dr. Kane, um, before you, a little bit later will be the, the replacement student laptops. So this, inf this software goes on those student laptops that timing is the essence so that when the kids start this September, um, all good, yeah, September this year, <laughs> um, they'll have everything in place. I guess technically you should have approved the budget before we went through all this. Mm -hmm. okay. I, and I'll do yes. that next time. I didn't catch. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, we don't have a funding source for this just because we have not approved our budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want to go back and prove the budget now? Is that what you, you want? You want us to change the agenda? Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, reflect that in my comment. I need a well, is, this, is this all going to be signed prior to July? I mean, you're talking about getting this done tomorrow. These, these will be FY20 purchase orders. Um, when will they be signed? Minute July 1. The budget. As soon as we approve the budget. Okay. Well, then if, then if it's immediate, we pull the budget. These are contingent of the budget being approved. Right. That's what I was going to say in my next comment. And they're budgeted. They're and in and they're, budget. they're, they're budgeted. They're in the base budget. They're in the 19 budget that we were in the 18 yeah, but, budget. But I, but I think that, our, you know, we haven't passed, or that they haven't, we haven't got a budget yet. Right. I mean, it's, it's so, yeah, so that's what we were saying. Do you want us to change the no, agenda? How do you we're just, I'll just do this. I'll word it that way. Need a motion to approve the purchase of Microsoft licensing um, from... Um, the Maryland Education Enterprise Consortium um, to the amount of $57,194.18, which will be paid for by the FY 2020 Technology Licensing Operating Budget when approved. When and do the FY 20? When the FY 2020 Operating Budget is approved. So moved. Okay. Second. I have a motion, a second. This is right. Board members, again, please respond. What's your name is called? Captain Kelly? Yes. Mr. Harper? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of your firm's motion carried. Thank you. Laptop purchase. So uh, the staff laptop purchase, uh, again, it's time for the natural, the natural uh, ebb and flow of our technology purchases. Um, to replace the student, I'm sorry, um, staff laptops. Uh, they'll be replaced with an HP EliteBook 840G3 uh, coming from Trinity 3, which is again an intergovernmental uh, cooperative purchasing agreement. Um, the total impact is $299,400. It will be coming from the FY 2020 technology capital budget. Um, that budget was reduced. Uh, by the county from our original request. However, funding is available. We've modified our requirements and funding is available uh, for this purchase. When you say modified requirements, you've modified the, the machine we're getting? Y yes, the machine. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Again. I'm sorry? How many are we getting? <coughs> uh, this one is 
600. This is for uh, <coughs> stacked laptops. And I'm sure there's a few spares built in there, just, well, you know, accidental this damage. Says we are doing a four-year lease for 3,300 3, laptop, laptops. Is that over the four, course of the four years? The three this, years? Is, this is an outright this, purchase. Looking this, oh, I'm looking, looking at the laptops. Ones, I the apologize. Yeah. This is staff. This is the staff <laughs> laptops. It's an outright Thank you. purchase. I apologize. Can you motion to approve the purchase of staff lap laptops? Let's um, specify. Uh, let's see. These are HP Elite Book 840G3 laptops with a four year warranty. It's an inter local purchasing system agreement. Um, it's $299,400 to be paid for by the FY 2020 technology capital budget when we approve the budget. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Bill members, please respond with your name if you call. Kevin Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Moussat? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of you firm with this motion carries. Thank you. Okay, Project Lead the Way laptops. So this is the Project Lead the Way laptop purchase. Uh, it is 130 Dell Precision laptops. Um, and again, just through the evolution of technology, it's time to replace these. Um, they are a little more robust machine uh, to run the necessary software that the PLTW courses require. Again, it's through um, the same company, Trinity 3, as part of the um, interlocal purchasing agreement. And the amount is $110,370. And again, coming from the FY 2020 technology capital budget funded and approved. Any questions? The, um I need a motion to approve the approval, approve the purchase of Project Lead the Way laptops, 130 Dell laptops, um, being made through the TIPS agreement. Trinity Three is the contractor, to the amount of $110,370, to be funded from FY 2020 techno technology capital budget when we approve it. So moved. Second. This is right. Members, is there any, please respond. Uh, Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Moussat? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of the affirmative motion carried. Thank you. Okay, last one. Last one. And this is the high school uh, laptop lease purchase. Uh, it is a four-year lease purchase of brand new uh, Dell Latitude 3300 laptops. We will be purchasing um, 2,550 laptops. Um, the cost of the laptops is $2,066,000, 2, uh, but $549,000 a year because of the implicit financing cost that's in there. So the total purchase here is $2,199,466,40 for the four-year period. Uh, each $549,000 will come out of each successive technology capital plan budget for 2021, 20, 22, and 23. And again, so the, the laptops are, the current laptops have exceeded or are ending their useful life, and this is simply the replacement of those going forward. Mr. It Mr. is funded uh, through the capital budget and approved. You said 2,500? 2,550. Yeah. Instead of 3,300? That's, that's the model, that's the model. It's the model. Sorry, okay. Okay, that because it doesn't say that's the model. I apologize. Um, yeah, to lease these. Okay. Yeah, it appears to look like 3,300. It does. I'm sorry. I saw that too. And I don't see it has a number in here. So this yeah, this is in our capital budget. This that, is capital. That's been approved Correct. by the county. Yeah, I see Correct. that. I see that. Yeah. Okay. I need a motion to approve the uh, purchase, the lease. I'm sorry, lease of 2,550 <coughs> Dell. Um, high school Dell laptops. Um, they it will be funded through the Meek again, Maryland Educational yes. Enterprise Consortium, and um, the total amount is two million one hundred ninety-nine thousand four hundred sixty-six dollars and forty cents to be spread over four years. Each year will be five hundred forty-nine thousand eight hundred sixty-six dollars and sixty cents and they will be funded out of the FY 2020 through FY 2023 te four-year technology capital budgets when they are approved. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any questions? 
Okay, this is right. Yes. 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 Yes.
legally required to do, um, have some mandates, has some restrictions and things like that. Our cost of doing business, just continuing on. Our program continuation, something that we've put in place in the past that must be funded going forward. And then new things, our additional considerations. So we have currently three staffing overhires that we can address with uh, this funding that we have. Uh, we still have to play with our salary laps a little bit, our attrition. Uh, so we're going to be increasing that by $60,000. We're going to fund our equal opportunities contract that I believe this board approved last month, $30,000. And then the last minute addition to the budget that the county gave us, they gave us an additional $107,000 for the virtual academy. So under learning accountability and results, be 4.5 positions for $292,103. No, I'll use the term general funds here, are going into safety and security. We are going to put $180,000 towards funding our bus contracts, towards our contract uh, that ends June 30th of this year. We'll be renewing that one shortly. In human capital, same numbers we've seen for a while. We need to increase our teacher retirement, just going, you know, some increased costs. We were able to reduce our health benefits a little bit because we're seeing some good performance from our funds and we have a healthy population right now. So we're just going to need to increase that modestly by $200,000. This is something new that you haven't seen before. Other fixed costs related to Kerwin funding. What this encompasses is with a 544 that we got from Kerwin for that funding, the special ed staffing that we're going to be using, the supplemental pre-K staffing, none of the funding that we got for that could be used uh, to pay for the fixed charges, the health insurance for these employees, the workers' comp, the retirement, the teacher retirement, as you know, that costs us about 7% because of those costs were passed on to the school boards, uh, you know, several years ago. So that is a cost to us that we cannot use, I'll use the term, in the yellow area to fund those. So we must fund those uh, going forward. They were very specific throughout this Kerwin process that we're going to give you money, but some of the fixed charges you're going to have to pick up yourself. And, and that's what this represents here. The compensation available for negotiations, as you know, we signed all five agreements uh, tonight. This is the same number that we've been talking about since the beginning of the year. Uh, so human capital there uh, is an increase of $2.8 million. If you add up all of this stuff in the white and green areas, there's your $3,301,545. Um, and if I go back up top, you'll notice that matches this green number, 3301,545. So those two align perfectly. We go down to the Kerwin area, and these again are the very specific things that we must do. Supplemental pre-K, we were awarded $217,000 for that. So we're going to purchase three um, kindergarten teachers. Uh, they're not new positions. We're going to pay for those three existing positions with this funding, which allows us to repurpose, and that's what the asterisk is there for, to repurpose those existing funds into addressing some of our cost needs with substitute teachers, home hospital, mandatory minimum wage increase that's going to take effect in January. The teacher salary incentive, again, under human capital, here's the exact number that's in uh, legislation, 544,458. With the special ed staffing, we're going to address some of the school needs. We're also going to be asking for a 0.5 secretary, a 1.0 teacher specialist, and then some increased stipings for, I believe, professional development. The transitional support instruction, this is going to be dedicated to a literacy and math screener. I know Mr. Pulisky can talk uh, about that if, if you have some questions. And then the mental health coordinator, a 1.0 position. Again, this is very restricted funds. We will set it up that way. We will go out. We will attempt to hire a, a coordinator of mental health. Um, whether we hire them higher than this salary or less than this salary, um, it must go in this particular area. So again, in here, under learning accountability and results, that's 9.5 positions for $827,213. And then the only other thing that Kerwin's going to fund is this 544 458 With that, the Kerwin funding, again, $1,371,671. And if I go back up top, it balances here as well. So adding the $2 here gets you the 4.6. That's the increase of our budget and therefore is a balanced reconciliation in front of you tonight for your approval, please. And be happy to answer any questions. The literacy and math screener, that's, I haven't seen that at all on the... That yeah, that, that, that's been in the, um, in Kerwin, it's the struggling learners. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that cat that's what that is and we're going to use it for a screener for a math um, and literacy screener okay for intervention looking who needs intervention well it's it could help us to understand who needs an intervention but it's for all students so that we can determine levels of performance where students are it screens them tells us where their reading levels are how they're performing mathematically and it does feed us information to tell us whether or not we should be considering a particular student for an intervention yes so of these 9.5 positions, six of them will be new ones, correct? Six and a half. Six and a half, 6. yes, ma'am. Six and a half. Three will just be distributing the funds differently, or the fund source will be different. We'll keep the three. Yes. We're not hiring three more. Right. Correct. It's the only unrestricted thing we could do to help us balance the budget. That pre-K? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Because it's paying for the existing students we have. Um, in the past, the state only funded um, pre-K dollars for those counties, and I believe there's three. Uh, Talbot's one of them, Somerset might be, in, I'm, I'm not sure, anyway. Uh, two or three counties in the state that had countywide full day. If they had countywide full day pre-K, then they got some state funding. So now what we've come back and says, well, anybody that has a full day program, regardless of whether you're countywide or not, through the Kerwin Commission, uh, you're going to be entitled to funding, as you know. We have several sites, and we've always footed that bill ourselves. We get no state funding and commensurate no local funding for those students. That we're <coughs> so, so the Kerwin money is increasing salaries for teachers. Yes, sir. But it's not paying other things that go along with when you have increased salaries. Correct. So we're absorbing some of that money, even though Kerwin's given a lot of money to it. We're still paying some of it. Yes, sir. So it's no free lunch. Uh, free lunch, exactly. Well, we're paying and the taxes, the benefits. The benefits. Paying the, be we're the paying benefit the increases off of terms. the Kerwin money. Yes, so, ma'am. I mean, they're giving us, like, a, you know, it's just for simple terms, a thousand dollars, but you got to pay fifty dollars to. Yes. To put it in. So put it in place. You know, it's, they're not paying. They're going to take credit for paying everything, but they're not. But they're not. The other thing is, it's this year. We've talked about this. Yes, sir. What next year? You're telling me. So because we met the, the, the requirement to get the Kerwin money was the, between the county and the board funded at least a minimum aggregate 3% increase. We well funded that for this county as we approved tonight. Um, so we are eligible for the Kerwin money this year and again next year. Again, it's not new money we're going to get in Kerwin. So the 544 we got this year stays with us for next year. Like a maintenance of effort. I mean, we pay it this year. Like it's, a a rare, it's a recurring cost. Yes. So ne we're, get, we're going to get it this year, and we're going to get it next year. Yes. Then tell me what happens. After that, the funding, the Kerwin Commission, <laughs> I can't tell you. I don't have my right. crystal ball. It's, it's, it's going <laughs> back to legislation. It's going so back to legislation. The there's going to be. Kerwin. But I just yes. want, you know, this, because in two years, everybody should forget about this if, mm, if they don't no, fund it. I I, not not this one. Not this one. Well, okay, but a lot of times states fund it and then say, well, we're not paying that anymore. Correct. And all of a sudden it falls back on us. And let's face it, we're not going to take less money out of our employees. Correct. And you see that through a lot of the grants. And I think we even had some discussion tonight. You know, some grants are there to get the program started. And the assumption is the county will pick that up afterwards. Mm -hmm. I don't believe the state is going to push it, put it to the point where they're going to give us this money and then leave us holding the bag, uh, us or the county. So. Um, through all the legislation that's going to be coming, all the discussions, the next set of work groups, the final report, all of that um, to start the legislation for next year is where they're going to change all of these funding formulas that we're going to get paid adequately for the not only the, all of the kids that we have, but the makeup of the kids we have. They're going to change the special ed formula. They're going to change the limited English proficient formula, the compensatory ed formula, all of that to increase those funding. So they're called grants but we're going to get the continuation of that funding. I'm stake my reputation on it. <laughs> Come see me in two years, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not, be, not, not to be cynical, but you know, a lot of times people promise things and do something that sounds good, yeah. and then mind slip, and then you know it falls back yeah. on the end user, and we're the we're, we're you know we're worried we have to take care of our people. If it was a hundred thousand dollar grant, I'd agree. But the billions of dollars the state's putting into this, it's not going to slip anybody's mind. <coughs> right. Not going to slip their mind, but I just hope it, they remember what they're doing. Yes, I believe they will. Yes, sir. So in this increase up here in the compensation, the 2.4? Yes. Okay, that includes the taxes that we're going to be paying on the Kerwin? No, the, 150, the 155 picks up the 
taxes for the Kerwin piece. Okay. The 2.4 is what we've always talked about since the beginning of the year. Includes the taxes of that, the increase that we're giving, okay. but it's not the Kerwin. That's why it's remained that number pretty much through all of our budget discussion. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I need a motion. Well, I need a question. Oh, I'm sorry, sure. So, okay. just, um, we need to approve our operating budget and we need to approve the capital budget, correct? Yes. It's well, we had we had some the um, county made a couple of changes to the capital budget from what we initially had. Correct. Um, and you've got those numbers. I've got those numbers. Yeah, I yes. need those numbers because they they took it down, and then they we, brought we it back pulled, up. I'm sorry. Yes, I did not. It. Yeah, I forgot. But I have yes. the numbers. Mm -hmm. We've just approved all these other things that need to happen, and we haven't seen the capital budget numbers. It's in my file. How much did it end up? Okay. Finally, being so if you'd like to, less so the more. capital budget that the county approved for us was four million nine hundred and four thousand dollars. What did we ask for? You have that number? I don't have that in front of me. Six something. Hold on a minute. Here we go. Six million nine hundred and seventy thousand dollars is what we requested. From you the know, county. we haven't um, looked at the capital, so we have a work session on the nineteenth. We need to look at the capital then, so we can um, yes can uh, make sure we understand what we're voting on. So we'll only address the operating budget tonight and the capital on the nineteenth. Okay, is that okay with it? That, that, that was actually the intent because we needed to get some things before you for purchase. So we're going to have to make sure that we get that for the 16th. So, so that means all of the uh, FY20 capital, we don't have any capital. I don't remember saying any capital. Oh, your technology is capital. Technologies, right. Yeah. All of those have to be on hold until we approve we the capital budget. There, I think the right. chair mentioned. Yeah. Right. We we so would we'll not put issue that on hold until we would not issue the purchase order until July one. Okay. So we need to clear that before. Yeah. Okay. I can't I can't write a purchase order today for next year. I have to wait till July one. Got it. That's no problem. Okay. So we'll just address. Thank you, Tammy, for that. Good point. Um, we'll only be addressing the operating budget. So I need a motion to approve the FY 2020 operating budget in the amount of 103 million three hundred and forty six thousand five hundred and forty nine dollars including the restricted Kerwin Commission funding as approved by the County Commissioners and as required by section 5-202 of the education article do I have a motion to approve it so moved do I have a second Sorry. So, Questions? Do you have a question, um, Michelle? You look perplexed. No. Any comments? Okay, Mrs. Wright. Yes. Yes. Mrs. Harlow. No. Mrs. Yes. Mrs. Smith. Abstain. I have um, three in the motion carries. Okay, motion carries. So the operating budget is, Thank is approved. Thank you. Um, I want to just bring out one thing. Yes. Next well, year, just some. Right. we have several thoughts going on for um, doing the budget next year. And early on, we need to sit and talk about how we're going to approach it, looking at some of the ways we've spent our money this year. Um, what things cost, um, how we're spending it. We, we didn't get deep into each individual line item this year. We only operated and discussed totally on what was coming in, what we were recommending above or what else we needed. And pre, pre, you know, starting at a baseline of what our budget was from the year before. So there is concern that we, we need to look at each individual budget item, certain ones, we see how we're spending that money and make sure that 
you know, it, it's being spent the way we want it to be spent. We didn't have a chance to do any of that this year, so it, it's, it's important to the board members that we do that. And we should start that in the October, you know, September, October time frame, so we have plenty of time to get through that. And it's pretty methodical. We've done that in the past, but ordinarily we've done it because we're trying to how, figure out how to reduce budget. We haven't, you know, we usually get less money than we want, so we go through item by item and say, take away 20000 here, 30000 there. We didn't have to do that this year because we got at least the minimum amount of our budget, and we actually got more. So that's a different approach that we didn't use this year that we need to um, look at. Everybody understand that? Baseline, I'm all for. Yeah, and we need to look at the baseline and be sure it's being spent the way we want it to. There's been some question on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fister. Yes, thank you. Um, no break. We'll skip the break. It, um, expenditure report, Mr. Fister, Fister you again. Uh, let me get, so before you is the expenditure report. Um, really, it's reflective of the transfer uh, request that you approved. Um, there's a negative, of course, in transportation that we're going to fix. Um, not much else to say about that really is um, we, every other category again we did our end of the year projections we, we've looked for that um, for the funding of where it needed to be everything seems to be with the exception of transportation on par with last year so again um, I just present that for your information if you have any questions I'd be happy to and that was answer for them our transportation department for our buses, just mainly the special ed and what we discussed earlier. That's what we discussed earlier, yeah. The one the, there's one line in there um, where you see the contracts uh, for transportation. The majority of that is our um, bus contracts with our contractors that run most of our um, regular ed. So we're at about 98% or 97% 98% in total, 98%. yes, ma'am. Well, we're, we're down to the last month. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, as, as, we, as we're tra trying to get you some information from an expenditure standpoint, a budget standpoint, contracts over 25000 as we're changing that, one of the things I wanted to notice on this report, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, it's dated 530. Um, the reason for that is I have to be flexible in the reporting that I'm giving to you based on uh, when you need the information. So it may not always be the very last day of the month, and a perfect example was last month. Uh, we did what we could um, because the board meeting was on the first day of the month. So to give you a picture of what it was the night before, um, you would not have had that information in time uh, for your board agenda. So you, we may see, and, and when it's significant by two, three, four days, I'll make note of that for you, but I just wanted to let you know that this was as of 5.30, not 5.31. Do we, do we get this, how often do we get this in the course of a year? Every, Every month, every month. Is, is a standard item on the, um, on the report. Uh, it is for information only. The only time it requires any kind of your approvals, like what you did tonight, when I need to move money between categories. And there's a, be another thing coming up shortly about a transfer um, notice, and I'll explain that when we get to that. I'll get up to speed on it, but some of the stuff is maybe front loaded, some's end loaded, depending on when these come due. Yes, uh, unique to this system, honestly, and not any other systems I've worked in. We actually uh, this system allows us to encumber our full-time salaries and benefits. So we get a picture, you know, you, first month of the year, you've got a huge amount of your budget already encumbered. Um, so yes, some of it is electricity bills we don't know except month by month, but certainly um, the technology purchases that we just approved these contracts will go in and do an encumbrance and therefore that's, even though we may not pay that bill for a couple of months, we've got the money set aside. But like we saw this transportation bill be quite out of whack. We yes, for like the last was, month or two. But you know, we, should, we saw that coming over the last month, I suppose, yes. I'm assuming. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was not a one-month surprise. And then if something hasn't been spent and we're only at, you know, we're halfway, they're two-thirds a year and we only spent 20% of it, then we can kind of figure out why it's going to be spent at the end of the year. Yes, sir. We work, we work with our account managers uh, to look at that very thing. Some things we do know uh, based on license renewals of when they come up. Uh, general, it, it's not something that we spend one-twelfth of our budget every, um, every month. Absolutely. And anything severely out of the ordinary he would inform us when oh, he absolutely. presents that mm -hmm. it's a monthly report we asked for yep so we stay on top of it the next one is the transfer notice and i notice you don't have any transfers these Correct. are transfers that you do not we do not go to the commissioners for
four, these are in category transfers, but we didn't have any then. But we didn't have any for the for the month of May. Um, but then when we closed out the month of May, realized that we needed to um, request the categorical transfer. So this will be that first time. This is now the standing um, agenda item that you'll see every month. Um, if there are some in categorical transfers, obviously I will report them here. But I'm simply reporting there were no monthly transfers. Uh, between object groups within our state mandated categories for the month of May. And we decided to put this as a routine on the agenda. So, otherwise, we only did it when it happened. Um, okay, textbook for 30 day review. Um, the elementary. Okay, Mr. Poluski. Yep, action item 10.03 textbook for 30 day uh, on behalf of the superintendents to recommend uh, to the board for the elementary social studies. Um, textbook series uh, to go out for 30-day review. Uh, we have not had a core textbook resource in social studies since I believe 1993. Uh, and as you know, social studies is a core area. We'll be adding an assessment uh, this coming year in eighth grade. Um, so, and then Mr. Tully is here. He could talk at length about it. But our just request is it will go out for 30 days for review, and then we'll come back in July for final approval. I mean, it's sitting in that. Uh, Did you put it over there, Mr. Tolley, then? Actually, the in ones the, that are in the bag, okay. My World Interactive. I want to look at it right now. But it, it comes out of next year's, it's for next year's budget, not this year's. Yes, it'll be in the, that's correct, it'll be in the capital FY20. Uh, the ones you approved earlier, Great. some of those will be coming out of the 19 and some of those will be coming out of the 20. Okay, so I need a motion to put the elementary social studies new textbook out for 30-day review. So moved. Second. All in favor, Ms. Knight. So the receipt is signed in the following name. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Bouchette? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carried. Okay. Next thing is policies for first read. Um, I just need um, a motion to um, put these four these policies out the complaint policy 112 regulation 112.1 .1, student data governance and privacy policy 705 regulation 705.1 they'll be going out for the first read so I need a motion to do that so moved second second okay any questions motion is second to put these out this is right Yes. 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 Okay. We have uh, some policies here to go out for the second read. Um, did we get any comments back on these from the first read? No. Um, okay. So now I understand our new system that goes out for a second read, and we approve it the next That's meeting. That's correct in July. Correct. July. Okay. That's still giving you enough time. The the, these will be fine. Uh, the other ones policy. that we have coming, absolutely, it'll, it'll be okay. It'll they be look okay. great. I mean, from what I, from what I've seen. And we did hold off on the equity policy. We still had to do some vetting through some groups, which is why it didn't go through uh, as yeah. first read. But we we'll hope to bring that back in July. Thank you. This isn't exactly on the subject, but every time I see the grading policy, it reminds me. Where are we with the way to grade issue? Well, as the as the policy says, if it's we do weight our courses, uh, and what the policy reflects is our current practice, and that is for advanced placement courses. Um, Mr. Watkins, which had led that whole uh, committee, uh, what we uncovered is that we needed to do more exploration around weighted grading, such as honors courses if they were going to be graded, um, looking at dual enrollment courses if they were going to be graded. Uh, so through the process, it's, it's really shined a light on we need to do more internal resource, research. Um, for an example, we currently don't have a process to approve honors courses. So what does actually an honors course mean? So we'll put those procedures in place in curriculum instruction, which will be part of this. Um, but based upon the current change of COMAR requiring grading and reporting, uh, we felt it was necessary. We had to reflect the current change in COMAR. But we wanted to make sure because we didn't have a high school policy on the books that we needed to get one as soon as possible that reflected not only the current COMAR, what we required, but what we're currently doing. I guess I wasn't clear. 
um, the discrepancy between AP classes and dual enrollment and how the credits are calculated. And I thought we were working with some of the other counties and they were kind of inputting their thoughts too and so this is we're all looking the, for a consensus. this is all over uh, the state is doing this every jurisdiction is doing this completely different uh, in fact three months ago I was an assistant superintendent meeting and this was the topic and I was sitting with five different assistant superintendents and everybody is applying weighted grading completely different so when does MSDE get into the <laughs> that's really a local Seven. jurisdiction um, at the purview to be able to award that currently. But that puts um, our students at a huge disadvantage, not only within well, their county and their peers, sure. but outside of their county with their sister county peers. How when, when is this happening? That's my question. Because I, as long as I've been on the board, we've talked about we've why don't we wait honors classes, <laughs> and we're still not waiting honors classes. Because yeah. I'll now I know what it's all about because I've got a child. And he sure. doesn't want honors classes because it's a lot more work and it's no more great. Sure. The, I mean, it's no the, the other side of this is that um, as we work on this, it's in the regulation. So when we, if we go in that direction and make that, we'll make that, you know, the board aware of that. But that's not necessarily in the particular policy, meaning it gives us more flexibility during the year uh, if we would move in that direction. The second thing you really have to think about in making a move like this is the implementation process, right? So you don't want to say any kid taking an honors class 9 through 12 begins this year because that would set a huge possible disadvantage. Right. So we would have to think with the incoming ninth grade class, I'm using this as an example of uh, 2021, beginning at that point forward, then any of those courses then would count for honors. And, and we have to have the process in place to say these are the criteria that make a course an honors course. So we've got to put some things in place before we could set, you know, those policies to set. I, I have a concern about <coughs> equity. I mean, we have a lot of students that just are not able to do dual enrollment for whatever reason. So they're never going to get a weighted grade. They may be as equally smart or capable as any student who stays within that brick and mortar building and takes all those AP classes, you're never going to get that extra. So it doesn't has, isn't because they haven't performed, but maybe their family dynamics, their financial situation, their, maybe they have a job, whatever it may be. Sure. If we're creating a disadvantage or a disparity. Well, actually, part of our um, Equal Opportunity Schools work is in getting those students who are not traditionally in advanced placement courses in those courses. I get that, but I'm even talking about, let's say, a straight A student who has the um, where for all to do it or has been flagged that certainly they qualify to do it. I'm sorry. They just can't. You're just stuck in dual enrollment. They're ju no, but dual talking. enrollment is where your weighted grades come from. AP classes yep. don't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. AP, AP classes are weighted. weighted. AP classes are the only Honors courses. Are not weighted. The only courses that we don't weight. We currently don't weight our our dual enrollment courses. But the AP classes are, are the ones. They are weighted. That's correct. Right. Currently, AP is the only the only course a child could take that would get advanced weighted grading currently. Not at Chesapeake College in the course that they would take there. Not at Patrick College course. But that's where dual enrollment's coming from. That's what that is. Yeah, but it's not a high school credit. credit. But they get credit for it. Yeah, but it's not weighted. They get elective. They, it's a college it, credit if they pass it. Correct. Um, but it's not weighted. So when it goes on the child's transcript, it is not weighted as an advanced placement would be. And I think that's, and, and we've started this work with Chesapeake College as well. Uh, you know, we're one of other four jurisdictions that also uh, works with Chesapeake College. Um, I will tell you of those five jurisdictions, it's all over the place. Um, who is awarding uh, college uh, weighted uh, grading for uh, those dual enrollment courses so um, you know and, and we take this very seriously to take a look at it more deeply and, and not necessarily the 
you know, there's different philosophical pieces of this, but a, a big piece of ours is how to roll it out and thinking strategically how to roll it out so it's fair and that it's... As Captain Kelly said, we've been talking about it for a long, 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 long time. Yeah. And I thought we would be further along. It's been about six years. You've been talking about it since you started. Yeah. So in the interest of time, yeah, um, can on. we get back to reviewing these policies okay. and setting them out for a second read? Yeah, I'll do it right now. Of course. Need a motion to move behavior threat assessment policy 508 regulation 508.1 and high school grading policy 629 and regulation 629.1 out for a second read. So moved. Second. All in favor, Mrs. Wright. So members, please, finally, in this call, Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Copper? Yes. Ms. Carlo? Yes. Ms. Lewis Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. I have five in the service motion hearing. Okay, last thing is future meetings. June 12th. Um, is eighth grade advancement. You have the list here of all the future meetings on your agenda. And our next meeting of our own is the school board work session on June the 19th. From 11 to 2? From 11 to 2. The normal work session. Something that's not on here is the fifth grade advancement and at the elementary schools. Uh, I mean, on the eight, I know the eighth grade is it's important too, but I. The fifth grade. If you'd like us next year to put it, we'll be happy to add that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Only because that's another another advancement. And I June seventeenth and uh third. Yeah, I need a motion to adjourn. Crazy. Motion to adjourn. So moving. <laughs> Get into this. Second. Item. Okay. All in favor, Mrs. Wright. Remember? Mrs. Kelly? Yes. 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 Okay. okay, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.